tonight, I'm bringing you the complete story of Howling in the Woods. A cryptid fantasy that I had the pleasure of narrating, and I hope you all enjoy tonight's story. I live in a small town surrounded by woods and mountains. Small to the point where everyone knows everyone by name. We have a single sheriff whose job mainly consists of kicking teenagers out of private properties. We have one grocery store, family owned, that everyone gets what they need from. If you need something special, you better request it two months in advance because every Amazon and USPS won't deliver out here. Our whole town survives on one large delivery truck. If it wasn't for the single road that leads out of here, we would be completely cut off from the outside world. Now don't get it in your heads that we are some backwoods lot who doesn't know what a smartphone is. We just take longer to get things. I have a PS4 and I have a laptop. I can enjoy some time on my stable internet when I'm too tired to hike. Despite being so small, we get along together greatly. Everyone helps each other out and we all work together to keep this place going. Crops harvested are bountiful and there is never a lack of game in the woods to hunt for meat. We have a river that runs from a lake about a couple of miles out of town where great fishing is at its best. Truth of the matter is, we don't need much from the outside world and we are all happy with that. The one problem with living independently is that when you call for help, there is nobody to come. Since our town's creation, we have had only relied on one being, the forest goddess. We bring her offerings from our town every month, and they are always accepted with the bowls and plates neatly washed and replaced by the next day. I still wonder who in town cares enough about the tradition to keep up that act, but we have enough retirement-aged folks who are gladly to go through the effort just to see the smiles on the children's faces. It must be like playing Santa Claus except once a month instead of once a year. I could understand it to a degree. I get a kick out of being the Easter Bunny every year. The goddess is said to have been the one who saved our ancestors from a pack of wolves as they were traveling west. She saved every settler's life, but not one of them could possibly repay her enough for her kindness. In appreciation for her actions, they asked her permission to settle on the land here so that they could bring her gifts every month. After some consideration, she accepted their offer, stating that she will forever protect them and their families. Since then, every blessing has been attributed to the goddess. The goddess has not failed the town since its foundation. At least, that's what it says in our town's museum. I don't even know why we have a museum, except to have an excuse for the teachers to tell their elementary students that they're going on a field trip. The goddess still has technically never failed us. But I guess if she is real, she's ramping up the difficulty. Things have been getting rough around here. Something has been howling up a ruckus at night. It has destroyed entire fields of crops. The game in the woods is becoming more and more scarce, and even the fish are disappearing. We figured an abnormally large pack of wolves might be migrating through our area. With time, we hoped the wolves would move along, but after a month, they still have stayed. This month's gifts to the goddess were much greater in contrast to how little we actually were able to gain. It appears the elders of our town still believed in the goddess may come back and kill these wolves for us. But once they hit my buddy's cattle, I was done waiting for the goddess. Jason's family had been cattle farmers for decades. They supplied the town with most of its beef. Their cattle were locally famous to the point when they needed to bring in a new cow, they would send one of our breeders in exchange for another farm's best breeder and a buttload of cash. So you could probably understand why Jason was boiling mad when he woke up to see three full-grown cattle stripped to bone in the middle of the night. That's the final line. I'm killing those damn mutts. Jason roared in my ear over the phone. 
Are you going to join me or what? Yeah, man. I'll get my gear and head your way. I replied groggily, still trying to work up the energy to lift myself out of bed. All right, just hurry. I don't want to lose those bastard wolves. We already have wasted too much time. Why didn't we do this when they hit Kimberly's farm? Or Brandon's? Hell, why didn't we just shoot the damn things when they first started howling at night? They're so freaking loud, my mom can't sleep. Jason was going into another one of his tirades. I shouldn't say it like that. He never got pissed about something that wasn't worth getting pissed about. When he did get worked up, though, it was all he could focus on. He had been like this since middle school. When he found out that Fred was picking on his little brother, Quentin, he nearly sent Fred to the hospital. As he grew to his now 6'4 and 300 pound frame, it's safe to say I'm glad we are best friends and hardly ever fight. I have a few other calls to make, so I think I could trust you not to get lost on your way here, right? Jason remarked with the slightest hint of a smirk in his voice. It was good to hear him cracking a joke. It means I should still be able to calm him out of doing something stupid. Yeah, I think I can find my way back. I know it's been forever since I last visited. I chuckled. Oh, did I leave my controller over there? I haven't been able to find it since Friday. Dude, forget about the controller. You could look for it after we get revenge for Lucy, Grace, and Tyson. No, they killed Tyson? I thought you said cows. This is personal now. I finally was starting to get as invested as Jason. Tyson was my favorite bull. He loved me ever since he was a calf. He ran right up to me and jumped in my arms. He would still try to jump on my arms every visit, but we had to train him to stop once he got bigger. I knew his death was going to hurt way more later, but right now the shock and anger was pushing me forward. Tyson broke out of his pen trying to save the girls. Judging by his horns, he put up a hell of a fight, too. I can't believe there isn't at least one dead wolf lying around here. You think they ate their own? Never mind. I don't want to know. I'm going to call Mitch, Dex, and Marcus. I think a six-man team will cut it. Or a five-and-a-half-man team since it's Quinn. Jason said in a loud, mocking tone as a muffled, Hey! could be heard in the background. I think just us two would have been enough to cut it, but safety in numbers... I responded while putting on my good boots. It was going to be a long hike. And cut Quinn some slack. He's 19 now. He's a big boy. Yeah, yeah. That's what I would expect to hear from another youngest child. You aren't going to fool me either with your youngest child propaganda. Alright, dude. Thanks for helping me feel a little bit better. But we are still going to take the task at hand. I'm going to get calling. You get the getting, you hear? Yeah, I hear you. I'm already one foot out the door, so don't go off without me. Somebody needs to keep a watch on you to make sure you don't hurt yourself. I ain't hearing all this shit again. See you soon. See ya. I hung up the call and checked my phone's battery. It was nearly at full charge. Unless we were going really deep, I can always call for help in case somebody walks off a cliff or gets bitten by something rabid. I turned it off and shoved it in my pocket. Hopefully Jason doesn't try to call while I'm on my way there. I go to my gun locker and grab my Marlin 336, a solid gun who has treated me great since the day Mitch's dad got a whole shipment of them for us for our 18th birthdays. With Mitch's dad being the best hunter in town, we knew to trust his judgment on hunting rifles, and he did not disappoint. There's not a deer in the woods who could escape us when we first got our hands on these babies. I'm sure that it will work great on wolves too. Finishing my admiration of my old reliable, I go to close the safe when I stop myself at the last second. I open it back up and consider my Mossberg 500. I bought it mostly for defense, in case a bear ever wandered into my house. But on a trip like this, it seemed like a good precaution. I went ahead and grabbed its case too before heading out. By the time I got the Jasons, Mitch was already there with a backpack loaded with gear. Apparently he had been waiting for a day like this to come. So, I packed all the tools of the trade. We got traps, we got motion cameras, we got bait, we got... 
Mitch was rattling off the name of every single paperclip and piece of string he brought along the Jason, as I noticed Marcus walking up. Hey Mark, what did you bring? Apparently Mitch brought his dad's entire stock. I joked, waving Marcus over. Oh shit, really? I just have some first aid kits and food and water. I thought that I was over-preparing since Jason said I only needed my gun. Marcus looked at his supplies with worry. He always came prepared, and I really liked that about him. I couldn't count the number of times the water had brought saved us from dehydration or a towel he had brought saved us from hyperthermia. If there was somebody that I knew that I could rely on, it was Marcus. He was talented in medicine as well, and was about to start his apprenticeship with Dr. Ripley. That is more than enough, Mark. I totally forgot about food and water. I sheepishly admitted. I was too preoccupied with my loadout to plan ahead. Are you sure? I could run back and get more. It's no problem. Marcus asked, already prepared the sprint back home. No. He's fine, Marcus. Jason chimed in. I knew he would do this, so I packed lunch and water for him, too. Oh, okay. Marcus's body relaxed, and he was walking to join the circle. So where is Quinn and Dex? Dex is still on his way, and Quinn is trying to find out where he left his hiking boots. Jason shook his head and defeated disapproval. Found them! Quinn came bursting out of the front door, proudly stomping around in his hiking boots. Maybe Jason was right. Quinn still had a bit of growing up to do. Great. Good job, kiddo. All that leaves is... I'm sorry I'm late. Dex came running up from behind me. I had to help Ma with the chickens. They were so spooked today, they wouldn't even come out of the coop. They know something nasty is going on here. Dex said in a whisper, as if the wolves were watching us and he didn't want them to overhear. He was the town local animal whisperer. He just had this knack for being able to soothe even the most feral of animals and befriend them. He's been having a rough time with the wolves in town, though. He feels the animals' fear and is getting harder for him to calm them as he becomes more afraid himself. The chickens aren't the only thing that are spooked. Are you sure you're up for this, Dex? You're ghostly pale. I asked him as I touched the back of my hand on his head. You're freezing, dude. I'm fine, he insisted while shoving my hand away. Sooner we get rid of these wolves, the sooner the animals and I go back to living normally and happily. I won't feel better while these wolves are still out there. So I'm coming along, and we are getting this over with. All right, Dex, you're still on for the hunt, but don't try anything funny like befriending the wolves and making us let them go like that one buck I had practically in my hands. These wolves are going to pay, and you can't talk us out of this one. Jason chuckled, half-joking, half-serious. It was one time, and he was the Alpha. His herd needed him. Besides, I don't think I could connect with these wolves, even if I wanted to. Do you hear them at night? Their howls are haunting. Ominous, even. It's like they're toying with us. All I know is that buck was easily going to be a 16-pointer. And now we have a beautiful buck with an orange vest running around that you won't let me shoot. Now forget about the howling. We're putting an end to that today. Follow me. Jason led us to the back of his house and towards the pens where the cattle had been. There were three fresh gravesites. I silently thanked Jason for burying the cows before we got there, so I didn't have to see Tyson in such a state. He led us over to a giant patch of blood that dragged off into the woods. This is it. The trail is easy to follow for now. But once we get in there, I'll need all of you to stick close to Mitch. I don't want you getting sidetracked by a fox's trail and getting lost again, Quinn. Jason snarked at his little brother. I was eight, Jason. Quinn snapped back. Yeah. And if you acted like you were any more mature than an eight-year-old, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Look, you either listen to what I have to say, or you're staying home, got it? Fine, whatever. I haven't even done anything yet. Jason takes a deep sigh and puts his hand over Quinn's shoulder, looking at him face to face. I'm sorry, Quinn. Just I need you to trust me today, okay? 
This time, you can't go off on your own or run up ahead like you usually do. I know that you think it's cute or funny, and sometimes it is, but if you break away from us, you could get seriously lost or seriously hurt. We're not going on the normal paths this time, and we're not hunting herbivores. Yes, you are smart in school, but I am the master in the woods. I'm taking you with me because I know how much Grace, Lucy, and Tyson meant to you too. Mom and Dad would kill me if you got so much as a scratch on you though, and I will never forgive myself if something happens to you. Okay, Quinn? I love you. Jason's eyes water up as he finishes his speech to Quinn. Quinn's eyes are running non-stop, and he could only nod his affirmation to his brother before giving him the tightest hug he possibly can. I've never seen Jason be so soft with Quinn before, Marcus whispers over to me. A death in the family does that. It makes us show our true emotions to the ones that we still have with us. Jason is blaming himself for this one, so try to forgive him if he gets short-tempered for a while. He is grieving, even though he doesn't show it. Yeah. How about you, man? You holding up okay? I'm fine for now. Reality hasn't really sunk in for me yet, so I'm good to go until we see this through. Then I'll be an emotional wreck too, so prepare yourself. I grin, nudging Marcus with my elbow. Thank you for asking, though. Jason takes a moment to try and discreetly wipe his eyes before standing straight again. Alright, last check. Bathroom, snacks, cell phones, ovens left on at home. This is your last chance to go back if you need anything. Is everyone good? Affirmations can be heard all around except for Mitch. Mitch, what's up? Jason turns to face Mitch, who is staring intently at the tracks. Are you sure these are wolves? These tracks are huge, dude. Look more like the size of a bear. And I know that you're built like Larry Allen, but I don't want to take our chances against a giant bear if it gets a drop on us. Mitch holds his hand next to the track, which is easily double his hand size. I know. But I know it was those damn wolves. I could hear them this morning. Look closer. Four toes. These are just some beefy sons of bitches, probably. Because they've been up in the hills for so long with no competition. You're right. The track shape makes sense for wolves. But seriously? These things must be a long-lost dire wolf if they're this size. Why are they even down here if they could grow that big up in the hills? Climate change? Quinn interjected before a glare from Jason made him go silent again. Doesn't matter so long as bullets can kill them. If we could hunt deer and elk, we could hunt some damn wolves. So you ready or what? I maybe should have brought some more bigger traps, but let's go. Mitch got back up to his feet and faced towards the forest. One by one, we lined up and followed Jason into the woods. Mitch followed behind Jason as the best tracker in case Jason got lost. Quinn was stuck in the middle between Mitch and me, so that he could keep an eye on him. Dex followed behind me and Marcus finished the line. Marcus liked to stay behind to make sure nobody broke off without being noticed. As we dove further into the woods, the sun struggled more and more to bring light down to us. After four hours of following the tracks of this behemoth wolf, we set up a small camp to take a snack break. How much longer do you think it'll take until we reach it? Quinn asked Jason. I don't know. If we got here earlier, we may have already found it. Wolves are typically faster than us humans, though, so it may have gained ground while we rest. Eventually, they would have to hide out, though. And once we find those wolves, they're all frickin' dead. Jason's tone held a hint of bloodlust I had never seen from him before. I understand completely why he is so fueled by revenge, but his tone is unnerving, even to me. I'm sure the den can't be too far, Dex chimed in. With how loud the howls are at night, they can't be holed up too far. Heck, at worst, most wolves have a hunting ground of about 30 miles. We have gone about 3 or 4 miles already. So if we keep at the pace, we'll find them before sundown. Dex gave Quinn a reassuring smile. Is everybody done? We should get back to it. 
Jason said, getting up and facing the tracks again. These ones are still a bit muddy, so they can't be too old. Make sure the rifles are at the ready. We never got a good count of how many of these things there are. But I don't want any survivors. Not even a pup, you hear me? Jason's back was turned towards us, and he was ready to march while the rest of us exchanged worried glances before reshaping formation. As we were walking past, something drips on my head. I wipe it off and check my hand, hoping to see anything but bird poop when my hand comes back red. I look up and the strips of gore littered all throughout the branches above. What the hell? I blurt out uncontrollably, making everyone else turn and look at what I was struck by. Good lord, what is all this mess? Is this some kind of sick prank? Jason said, surveying the unrecognizable chunks of meat hanging up by the ribbons. Hell man, no wolves did this. Mitch shook his head in disbelief. I could feel Quinn now shaking behind me. I turned to check on Marcus and Dex, but Marcus is frozen in shock, and Dex ran behind and was vomiting. Once we regain our composure, we all exchange looks, nobody having any idea what to make of the scene before us. Let's just get moving again. We can report this to the sheriff once we get back. It's probably just some leftover work from a bobcat, or a flock of eagles. Nature is gross sometimes. We have our own problems to worry about. Jason finally pipes up, assuming a commanding role. I don't know, Jason. That's really not normal. I've never seen or heard anything like it. I think we should go back. Quinn interjects. A deep sign escapes Jason, as if he was expecting Quinn's opposition. If you want to go back home, go home. These wolves aren't going away until we do something about them. So you could go back and cower at home, but you'll be thanking me when you still get bacon for breakfast in the morning. Without any further hesitation, Jason marches forward, and reluctantly all of us return to our positions and follow him. None of us feel like arguing against him. But I think we all know, including Jason, that was not a normal animal's doing. Six more hours passed, and our morale was at an all-time low. Quinn kept looking back at me to ask Jason for a break, but Jason was marching a warpath. Whoever broke his concentration now was going to feel some heat, and I wasn't wanting to deal with that unless I had to. I was hoping the setting sun and increasingly limited visibility would encourage Jason to have us turn back while we still had some light. Wait, what the hell? Jason stopped in his tracks, causing the rest of us to bump into each other. You've got to be kidding me. Damn it, Mitch. What the hell is this? Jason shouted, pointing to the small clearing up ahead of us. The same clearing we had sat at six hours ago. You can't be serious, Jason. You and I both watched the tracks. You know we didn't stray off path. It probably was just patrolling its territory. Mitch was working hard to find a logic in how we wound up in a giant loop. Or we followed old tracks and wasted our time today. I thought you were going to fill in your dad's shoes. If we put you in charge of hunting, the whole town is going to starve. That's not fair, Jason. You and I didn't see any other tracks. How could we get on the wrong path? So what? You're saying the wolves are toying with us? The wolves led us in a giant circle on purpose? Just admit it, you messed up. Jason, hey, let's relax. What's done is done. We could set up traps at your place instead and stay up until we catch the wolves. We won't let another cow become a victim to these rabid dogs. Marcus interjected, trying to draw Jason's attention to him while I pulled Mitch aside. Mitch, don't take it personal. Jason is really emotional right now. He doesn't mean what he says. I whispered to him. I know, dude, but it's still messed up to say. He knows I worry about replacing my dad, and he isn't being fair. He's just saying hurtful things because he's so angry. You're a great tracker and you're going to be even better than your dad. I tried to reassure him, but our attention is quickly pulled away. Hey, y'all, listen. Dex shouts, 
silencing all of us. After a brief pause, I speak up. What is it? Listen. It's silent. The trees are silent, Dex says, now in a more hushed tone. No shit, the forest is silent, I've been yelling. Animals don't typically like that, Jason retorts. No, think. When did you last hear a critter? Even when we were walking quietly. Dex stares intensely at Jason, causing Jason to take the question seriously. A while before we set up camp here, the first runaround. What about it? Jason's eyes grew wide shortly after finishing his sentence as the realization dawned on him. His eyes shifted immediately to Quinn. He must have remembered the grizzly scene not far from here, realizing whatever made that is probably back and very close. It sounds crazy, but what if... Dex was quietly cut off by Jason. We are heading back now. All hints of anger in his voice had been replaced by sheer panic, and we all huddled together and began jogging back. Quinn, you stay in the middle, you hear me? Don't you leave until we get home. Jason shouted as we jogged. Why? What's going on? What was Dex about to say? Quinn demanded answers. I was going to ask, what if we are the ones being tracked? Maybe we had been getting stalked the whole time. Dex suddenly grinned. With that, we all picked up the pace a little bit. Not running to make us appear like prey, but just fast enough to get home in time before we got stuck out in the woods at night. The sense of danger loomed over us with every step we took. The feeling of being watched has never been so strong before in my life. Every creak and crack within the forest caused us to go just a little bit faster, until we all made a dead stop. There's something in the path. A buck lays, bleeding from an enormous gash running down the length of its body. Its breathing is slow and labored. Is that a deer? In the middle of the path? Is it alive? Quinn asked, barely holding back his panic. That's Alpha. The buck Dex won't let me have, Jason replied. Alpha? We have to help him then. Dex, come on! Quinn went the run towards the buck, but Jason grabbed his arm tight. Quinn, no. This ain't right. Predators don't just leave prey alive and breathing, especially not these damn wolves. There was nothing left of... Quinn ignores Jason and breaks his grip. Quinn, damn it, no! Jason starts to run after Quinn towards the buck, but Quinn is faster. We all start running behind Jason. The moment Quinn reaches the buck, an enormous shadow envelops him. Quinn barely had time to look up, before the creature dropped down on him and crushed him against the ground. The figure is grotesque, as if any ungodly creature from the worst imagines of a gothic horror or something that had crossed the realm of fiction and entered reality. It stands on four thick canine-like legs. From the sides of its body are two more gorilla-sized arms, with unnaturally long fingers that end in dagger-like nails. Its head is a massive wolf's head, with the teeth being mixed of canine and shark. It snarls at us, and we all are paralyzed by this monstrosity. Quinn let out a whimper, and with a glance, the creature slams its hulking arm down upon him again, flattening him into nothing but a mess. Quinn! Jason lets out a battle cry, breaking me from my paralysis, and begins unloading his Marlin 336 into the monster. I draw my gun and do the same. We both empty everything we had loaded into the beast. And when Jason hears his gun clicking, he rushes the monster and starts beating it with the butt of his rifle. Through all the attack, the creature barely flinches. After a couple more hits from Jason, the beast picks him up in both arms and effortlessly rips him in two. It looks in my direction and hurls the upper half of Jason to me. It feels like being hit by a cannonball and I could feel my lower spine snap as I go flying. 
Mitch drops everything and attempts to make a run for it, but the monster is quicker than it looks. It charges him, grabbing him by the back and forcing him to the ground as it drags him at full speed. A red trail of blood and flesh is left behind it before it slams the remains of Mitch into a tree. Mitch's body stays smeared in the giant crater left behind in the old oak as the beast removes its arm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I could hear Dex chanting over and over again. I look over to see him curled up in a ball, weeping as the creature slowly approaches him next. I pull out my Mossberg, but I can't find the strength to lift it. Come on! I hear a whisper to my right. I look over to see Marcus hiding behind a tree, waving for me to hide with him. I can't move. My back. My legs don't work. Go! I manage to whisper back before a foundation of blood comes rushing up my throat. Marcus looks at his escape and then back towards me. He shakes his head and comes crouching, running over to me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I... A sickening crunch fills the forest and Dex goes silent. After a short pause, I hear the beast punching the ground again, then again as it works itself into a frenzy, flattening the remains of my friend. I keep my eyes averted, but I cannot deafen myself to the brutality. Shit, Marcus. You were supposed to run. You could have made it, I strain to say. You do the same. Just give me your arms. Marcus goes to pick me up, but I shove him back as adrenaline fuels me enough to raise my Mossberg and fire directly into the beast's face as it snaps to take Marcus's head off. The powerful shot hits its eye and it recoils, covering its eye with one hand and swinging wildly with the other. I hold my Mossberg up defensively, and its claw cuts right through it before catching Marcus's on the neck. The swipe catches under Marcus's jaw, and as the beast yanks its arm up, his head is torn clean off. I could only watch as my last friend I had falls to the floor, and his head rolls off into the woods. Defensiveless, alone, and tired, I resign myself to my fate as I look the monster in the face one last time. But the death blow didn't come. Instead, a white flash came from the trees and struck the beast hard enough to send it crashing through multiple trees. I blink, and before me stands a woman. She is in glistening white armor, holding a large sword in one hand and carrying a shield strapped to her other arm. I always wondered what my brain would hallucinate before death. In a blur, she is on top of the beast again, slashing it faster than my eyes can process. The monster howls in pain before a frenzied swing catches the woman and she goes crashing against a tree. It gets back up and faces her as she shakes off the blow. At full speed, the monster charges toward her, but she gracefully steps sides the beast and runs her sword along its body as he passes. The beast topples over, unable to stand. It hurls its fist towards the woman but she drops her sword and catches it with both hands. With some effort, she twists the hulking arm of the monstrosity and breaks it. The thing howls out again in pain. The woman picks back up her sword and stands on the monster's neck. With one last powerful swing, the beast's head falls from its shoulders, and she stands triumphantly before turning back towards me as if she had just remembered I was there. My vision is starting to go from fuzzy to black, and the last thing I remember is the feeling of someone picking me up, and the faint sound of wild howling in the distance. I've just awoken in a shack out in the woods, and I have no clue where I am or who lives here. The first thing I could think of is to pull out my phone and write everything I could remember. I still have some signal, so I must be somewhere close to town. I'm going to send this in hopes that it reaches somebody. As long as someone may know the truth of what lies in these woods, maybe the next people will have a chance. I hear something coming towards the shack. Whoever you are, whatever you do, 
if you hear the howling coming from the woods, run far away. As the unknown being approached the flimsy shack, I expected to meet my end. I stared at the phone in my hand to see if my final message would be sent. As the door flew open, I braced in preparation for a horrid figure. Would I be eaten alive? Would my body be used to lay eggs in? What awful fate had I stumbled upon? You're awake. An excited feminine voice announced. Near-death experiences made your mind do funny things, but I swear to you, when I heard those words, I almost muttered, Tom Howard, you sly bastard. I guess on this day, in my darkest moments, I fall to humor as my crutch. I was beginning to worry that I did not make it in time. A woman comes bursting into the shack and sits right in front of me, inches from my face. She is pale, with hair as white as the purest snow. Her eyes shine with an emerald green that could pierce the soul. She is tall, maybe 6'3". She looks like she could be some Olympian. Starting to break out of my daze, I begin coming up with more logical thoughts. Where am I? I ask, scooting myself a couple of inches back. My house, of course. Where else could I take you? She stated it as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. Right. And who are you? The second I ask the question, her face falls a bit. Have my statues decayed over the centuries? Your people have long called me the goddess of the forest, but I prefer that you call me Teresa, she said, holding out her hand. I take it and she gives me a firm shake. The goddess? You're real? Of course I am real. Well, I am not an actual goddess, but I most certainly am real. If I was not, could you feel this? She grabs my ankle and lifts my leg up an inch before letting it go. I don't know for sure what that proves. The mind can play sensory hallucinations. My legs! I could feel them! I could move them! How? My back was broken when... My thoughts returned to my rescue. You were the one that saved me. Teresa gives a proud smile and a nod before her expression changes to one of sorrow. I could not save your friends, though. I am sorry. I have failed to protect your kind. So, they are really gone? You could not heal them like you healed me? I asked, risking the last grain of my hope being crushed by the answer. No, I cannot revive the dead. As I said before, I am not truly a goddess. That is just what your people thought I was. I am closer to what you would call a wyvern or a dragon, I am. She stops herself as she notices the tears flowing from my eyes. I am here for you if you need anything. She moves to sit beside me and holds me in a hug as I grieve for my lifelong friends. We sit there for hours as everything catches up to me all at once, and I let everything out. After some time has passed and my sobs had subsided, she speaks up again. The soup I am making should be well done by now. You should eat. You haven't eaten in a week. Food does sound nice. Wait, a week? I thought I only had slept through the night. I was startled at this realization. Does my family think I am dead too? They must be worried sick. To be precise, eleven days, but that did not seem important, she says, bringing in two wooden bowls filled with herbs and chunks of salmon. She picks me up and somewhat forcefully sits me down at the small table next to the window. She excitedly rummages through the dresser behind me before pulling out a fork and a spoon and placing them both before me. I have not had company in a long time, not since my kin divided. I have had so many questions. She takes the chair opposite of me hastily and tries to control herself before bouncing up and down to sit in. She takes a deep breath and regains her composure, trying to return to being polite and regal. But I am sure you have more questions for me, so I shall let you ask first. 
11 days? Has anyone tried coming to look for me? I see a bit of confusion on Teresa's face before she appears to have a realization. My apologies. I forgot that days are much longer time for humans. That would be alarming to you, yes. Your people have searched for you, but I have guarded them from harm. No one else has been harmed by the Wolvenir. The Wolvenir? Is that what that creature was called? There are more than one? Every answer I received seemed to only open more questions. Oh my, I am getting ahead of myself. Please forgive me and let me explain. Yes, the creature that attacked you and your friends is called a Wolvenir. It is the twisted alchemy of the ones who hunt my kin. We do not know how they are created, only who creates them. We call them the Underdwellers, creatures with forms similar to yours that came from the underground. They seek to conquer this planet in its entirety, but your kind are already here. The Underdwellers are not as resilient as their Wovnir. They fear your weapons and your numbers. If you were to go to war with them directly, they would surely lose. Teresa takes a pause to sip some soup and make sure I do not have any questions. The Underdwellers have taken to hunting my kind as a way to gain the advantage on humanity. They wish to harvest our scales and bones for weapons, and our blood for potions. Our scales and bones cannot be scratched by any earthly material or any normal means. The Underwriters are clever, however, and created a poison. They use this poison to target our weak points. Our eyes, when they are open, the openings of our ears, and, and any place where a scale has shed or been knocked off. Centuries ago, the last of my kin decided to abandon our dragon forms and disperse. Our plan was to hide in remote areas until the day humans discover the Underdwellers, or the day the Underdwellers launch an attack. We each pick a spot and told no others about it, to protect against spies or torture. We can disguise ourselves as any form of human, so some took to the cities and lived amongst humanity. We cannot expose our existence, however, or we run the risk of being found and hunted. We cannot trust humans to refrain from hunting us for their own gain like the Underdwellers. Teresa stares at me intensely to emphasize this point. So why are you able to trust me? I asked honestly. I will kill you if you betray me. She says this with a pleased look on her face before bursting out laughing at my apparently hilarious expression of fear. I only jest, although you may be with me for a long time. What was your name? She gives me a sheepish expression, realizing she had never asked me my name. Oh, it's Toby. Toby, Toby, and Teresa. I like it. Teresa takes a moment to admire my very average name before she remembers what she was talking about before. As I was saying, the truth of it is, Toby, you may be with me for a very long time. The rest of our lives, even. She says this grimly. Our lives? Haven't you lived for centuries or millennia? Humans don't live that long. I replied, puzzled she wouldn't already know that. I know, Toby, but you are not human anymore. You are somewhere between human and me. Teresa is morseful as she explains this to me. Even though I know what she is about to tell me is going to be bad news, her care for my emotions still touches me. You were in a very dire state when I was able to make it to you. You would have not survived with human medicine. Your heart was pierced, your lungs were crushed, you were on the verge of death and I did not want to allow you to die. I gave you my blood. You gave me your blood? Why? Yes, my kind heals extremely fast, especially compared to your kind. Our healing power comes from the blood, but once the blood is given, its effects cannot be reversed. You inherit some of my power. You heal as fast as I. Your body is stronger and faster as well, and your lifespan is expanded to that of one of my kin. Teresa puts her hand over mine as she says this. You cannot shapeshift like I, and you will not ever age. 
You could return to your village for a decade, maybe two, but eventually people will start to notice that you are not aging. You will have to leave and never return at that time. If you are discovered to be unaging, you will be thought to be one of my kin by the Underdwellers and hunted down just like me. Teresa's head sinks and she begins to cry. I give you my deepest apologies for this I did to you. You will have to leave everyone you know behind. I know how horrible it is to lose all of your family. I know. I could not think of another way to save you, though, and I could not let you die. Teresa starts to weep more intensely. It is obvious she suffers greatly of her solitude. She feels guilty for giving me the same fate. As I try to process the news I have been given, I can't help but worry about the pain Teresa is feeling. I do my best to be kosher instead and try to comfort her. Teresa, it's okay. You did what you thought was best and I am grateful to be alive. You saved me and I will always appreciate that. You have still given me time to be with my family for that I would not have had if I died yesterday. I mean, 11 days ago. Even when I do have to leave them, they will know that I am leaving alive, and that is a much better thought than them discovering me out dead in the woods. And when I do have to leave town, I could come live with you, right? So I won't be completely alone, and you won't have to be alone anymore either? I squeeze her hand reassuringly as she works to compose herself. Right. I'll take good care of you. We will be the best of friends for centuries. She shakes my whole arm up and down trying to shake my hand in an affirmative way. She finally dries the last of her tears and looks back up at me. My dearest apologies. I said I would let you ask all the questions and then I went ahead and stole the conversation anyways. Do you have any more questions for me? Hmm. I look around the shack and take more notice at the odd amount of modern items. Where do you get all these things from? Oh, these? These are all gifts from you and your kind down below. They are all so thoughtful and sweet, like the curtains for my window. It was always so bright out in the middle of the day, but now I block the sun out or the cold in winter. She walks over and pulls the curtains for emphasis. Wow, all this time I thought it was some town leader who would take the gifts, like playing Santa Claus. Santa Claus? What is that? She furrows her brow. Oh, um, well, he is a legend of a jolly old man who lives on the North Pole. He makes toys for children all year round, and on Christmas Day, he brings presents to all the nice girls and boys and gives the naughty ones coal. There exists such a human? He sounds very amazing and kind. Teresa's eyes sparkled as if she herself was a child on Christmas Day. Yeah, uh, he's, um, he's pretty great. I'm confused, though, Teresa. If you can shapeshift to look like anyone and you're trying to hide yourself as a human, why do you look like that? Like what? She recoils as if I offended her, which I might have. So, first off, you are very pale, like ghostly pale. Not many humans in the world are as pale as you are and most that are that pale live up north. Like Santa? No, well, yes, but not that far north. Also, your hair is pure white. Most humans who have pure white hair are very old, but you look about my age. Teresa instinctively starts covering her hair with her arms. Is there something wrong with me? She asks, looking mortified and hiding herself behind her arms. No, no, you look fine. It's just, you kind of stand out. Not many people look like you. So if you were trying to blend in and hide it, it would seem like an odd choice. Oh. Teresa lets her arms slide back down to her side and starts fiddling with her fingers. Well, I did not get to see many humans before I had to take shape and hide. In fact, was when your village first settlers were surrounded by those rabid wolves. I picked what looked like me before and I have kept it ever since. She gestured towards her armor and sword in the corner of the room. In my true form, I have white scales, so I wanted to be a human with white hair. I was a lucky one in this regard. 
The other colored dragons, like purple, blue, and green, all mad because they could not keep their original colors. But there are no green skin or green haired humans, she giggled. Not naturally. But if any of your green or blue or whatever colored friends are still around, there are hair dyes for almost any color you could think of. Wait, why did you point to the armor? We're talking about your scales. Don't tell me. Really? That would make them so happy. And you are correct if you are thinking that my armor is made out of scales. My scales. My sword is made out of one of my baby teeth. She quickly rushes over and picks up her gear before handing it to me. This giant sword is a baby tooth? It's almost my height. I lay the sword down on the table, trying to figure out how large it actually is. It had to at least be five feet. Well... It is made out of my baby teeth. My actual tooth is much larger, but we had to cut it down and shape it so that a human could hold it. The same goes for my armor. It was all made out of one scale. She holds it up proudly. Her armor shines a brilliant white that goes completely unblemished. So, Teresa, where did you learn to speak English? I find myself asking, breaking the momentary silence. My speech? I learned most of it a few centuries ago before I came here. The people I hid near spoke it. One day, though, I heard about a new land being discovered, and I thought maybe it would be safe from the Underdwellers. So I snuck on a ship that was sent to sail here. Teresa speaks thoughtfully as she recounts her adventure. That would explain a lot, I accidentally mumbled aloud. Explain a lot about what? First my appearance, now my speech. Do you have anything else to critique while you're already on the topic? Teresa begins to glare at me, folding her arms. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. You just have a bit of an English accent, and you have some mannerisms that are odd to me. I have an English accent? You just said I am speaking English. How could I have an English accent when speaking English? She looked even more miffed than before. Before I could answer, she raises one hand to silence me. Her eyes dart back and forth as an intense look washes over her previously cheerful face. A familiar growl is echoed from the other side of the wall. Teresa waves her hand to draw my attention. She points to me then points down, to which I assume means stay here. Slowly, she raises up and picks up her sword resting against the wall. As she pulls it up, it makes a substantial clang against the shield resting atop of it. But that was all the noise needed to make the beasts outside go into a frenzy. In an instant, the shack was shaking on all sides and threatening to collapse. Teresa bolts out the door in a blink, slamming it closed behind her, and the rumbling of the shack ceases as the wolf nigher chase after her. I peek out the window to see if she's okay. Three Wolvnir circle her as she stands unarmored with only her sword. The Wolvnir all charge Teresa at once. She charges back at one facing her and dives underneath it, splitting it from jaw to tail. Blood rains down upon her as she rises back to her feet and lets out a battle cry. The Wolvnir, unfazed, continue their charge. She stepsides one, cutting deeply into its sides, but the second creature grabs her by the ankle. The creature slams her against the ground over and over until she goes limp. As it realizes she is no longer resisting, it lifts Teresa to its maw, ready to indulge its kill. I sit frozen as my only protector is about to be eaten before I notice Teresa's sword still firmly in her grip. Teresa takes her opportunity and slams the blade through the skull of the Wolvnir. Its body falls limp, and she pries herself from its grasp. Just as relief is about to wash over me, suddenly my view turns in the snarled teeth, and I feel the wind from a wolf near's jaws snap shut. In my fixation on the battle, I lost track of the other beast. I screamed bloody murder as I backpedaled towards the wall. The beast slams its entire head against the wall bending it inwards with each push before one final slam sends its head rolling to my feet. Teresa is standing in the doorway, coated in blood and breathing heavily. She stares daggers into me, and the bean, who once gave me comfort, 
now has been replaced with that more resembled of a raging animal. I told you to stay put. She growls as she takes a step closer. She reaches her hand towards me and I flinch instinctively. She does not hesitate grabbing the wolfnir's head and flinging it out the window where it splatters against a pile of rocks. Absolutely disgusting. Teresa mutters, staring down at the blood that now coated the floor. I get a better look at her and notice that she is not without injury herself. A gash has formed near the top of her forehead, and her sides are cut deep from where the wolf near picked her up to devour her. Her attention shifts back to me, but her expression does not soften. Come here. Teresa grabs my arm and pulls me outside. My heart is beating a million miles a minute as I am pulled behind her. I hope to myself that wherever she is leading me isn't some execution spot for being more trouble than I am worth. Maybe she realizes I am too much of a liability and decided to get rid of me now. She takes me around the back of her shack, which I probably shouldn't call it that in front of her, and I notice we are still deep in the forest. We walk about five minutes before she leads me towards a small clearing where there is an assortment of things, human things, placed overlooking a steep cliff. Look, I learned everything else from you all. If you think I speak weirdly, you are to blame. She points a finger towards the small campsite. I think for a second that there must be someone who uses this as their secret camping spot, before I notice the telescope is pointing towards the town instead of the sky. Wait, you're still on the topic of how you speak? That's why you're angry? I stare in bewilderment at Teresa, but she doesn't break her glare. I watch your village all the time during the day. I watch your gestures, your greetings, your goodbyes, and I even read your lips while you talk. I can read lips very well. I have worked really hard to keep up with the new phrases and lingo. That is not cool enough for you, dude. Teresa, I'm sorry. I don't mean to upset you. You speak wonderfully, and it is incredible that you are so dedicated to keeping watch over us and trying to fit in. If you lived with us, you totally would pass as a human, no doubt. You would just sound like an out-of-towner, that's all. Human language changes so fast, so the place that you learned it from speaks it a little differently than how it came to be here. As I try to mend the mess I got myself into, Teresa's body relaxes. She walks past me and up to the telescope. I do have to confess, I did not always have this, um... Teresa points to the telescope. Telescope? I answer uncertainly. Telescope, she says sitting down and gesturing for me to come closer. I only received this gift from your town only a short time ago, 20 years ago. She looked over at the telescope, wiping both lenses gently. Ever since then, I have been trying to catch up with the human social interactions, but I don't know it all. I give it great effort, because I have long thought about trying to live with your kin. Even if it is for a short time, just to break the loneliness. Of all the gifts I have been given, this one is my favorite. Teresa places her hand on the telescope and begins looking through it. Wait, this came from our town? Let me take a look for a second. I take a closer look at the telescope. It looks exactly like it did in the box. She has taken incredible care of this thing. I look over to the nearby tent and see there is no bedding or anything else inside it, only three indents in the tent floor from a tripod. Did the telescope come with the note, Teresa? She lifts her head and looks at me surprised. I believe so. Unfortunately, it has rained on the night I went to retrieve your gifts, and I was unable to make sense of the paper left with it. That's okay. You probably wouldn't be able to read it anyways. My handwriting was horrible when I was little. You're... Surely you must be joking. You are the one who offered me this? That was me, all right. I had to beg my parents for months to get our storekeepers to bring one in to purchase. Then I had to convince them again to let me leave it for you. When I first heard the story about the goddess and how she lives here and I thought about what you must miss back home, 
I couldn't imagine being away from home for more than a day, much less a hundred years. I wanted to give you that so that you could look back up to heaven, your home. I wrote my letter telling you that if you ever get lonely, that I will talk to you. I turned away from Teresa, now feeling embarrassed sharing my silly childhood thoughts. You really did all that for me? What a sweetheart you are. I never thought I'd get to meet the one who gave me the most valued gift. Thank you dearly, Toby. I feel myself blushing for my compliment, and it only gets worse as she wraps her arms around me in a giant hug. You kept your offer even after I so rudely never replied to your letter as well. I cannot keep mad at you after all that, can I? I apologize for getting angry with you. She lifts up and helps me get back on my feet. Besides, I must request a favor from you. Her expression changes from kind to serious again, and I worry that all is not actually forgiven. Sure, uh, what can I help with? I replied, trying not to show any hints of uncertainty. Night will come soon. I know you only woke up today, but I need you to accompany me tonight. I will be hunting any wolvenir that threatens the village. I am both shocked that she would ask me to come along to face those beasts, and absolutely terrified of the idea of ever seeing one again. No, I mean, wouldn't I be safer hiding in your sh home? Your home? I caught myself just before I was going to blurt out shack again. My sure home? Teresa raises an eyebrow at me. Unfortunately not. We have already been found here once. They could certainly discover us here again. My home is not fortified to withstand Wolvenir. I never had to worry about something being attacked while I was away before. I stood guard over you while you slept. But in that time, the Wolvenir have grown bold. They are straying closer and more spread out around the forest. I worry if I do not intervene, they may attack into your village. Teresa pulls on my arm and we start walking back towards her shack. I use the time it takes to walk back to try and work up the courage to go with her. In the encounter we just had, all I could do was stand, stunned, or run. When we got back, I noticed something I missed on the walk out. Five mounds of dirt laid on the side of Teresa's home, each with fresh wildflowers and a blank headstone. To the far corner is a pile of dried flowers along with some chunks of stone. Are those is all like a get out before I choked up. Teresa looks over at me and begins to pat my back. I did not think I could sneak them into your village cemetery, and I did not know any other place I could put them. Teresa speaks softly. I hope this is acceptable. I nod my head yes as I fight a losing battle to hold back my tears. Every time I see something that reminds me of my friends are gone, it feels as though they are being ripped apart in front of me again. The shock, the pain, the sorrow, the guilt, they all come crashing together to deliver the world's cruelest sucker punch to my gut. Why did their lives end and not mine? I should be dead, just like them. For what point am I alive? Why did any of us have to die? Just why? Some questions do not have answers. Some things are just. Some things just are. And it is not the fault of anyone. Some things are reasonless. Teresa comes back cleaned and fully equipped in her armor. I didn't even realize she had gone. I am responsible for your survival. But I cannot tell you why you were chosen to survive. You were the only one still whole when I reached you and your friends. Call it luck or choose your own answers to your questions. Teresa hands me a dagger and five scraps of cloth. I took a piece of each of your friend's shirts. I buried them in the order so you could mark the graves properly. I hold the scraps to my left hand and the dagger in my right hand. It looks like the same material as her sword. My own answers? I ask, as I approach the first grave. Their life's ended, but mine has not, because I will live my life for all of us. I place Marcus's cloth on the top of his flowers and carve his headstone. Here lies Marcus, a selfless healer who gave everything to save me. 
I should be dead, but I am not. I place Dex's cloth with flowers and carve on his headstone. Here lies Dex, a man whose love for all forms of life made him truly one with nature. I am alive for the point of making sure the tragedy that happened to my friends will never repeat itself. I place Mitch's cloth amongst his flowers and carve on his headstone. Here lies Mitch, a man whose greatest wish was to provide and care for his town. None of us had to die that day. If not for a hidden evil, we would all still be alive. I place Quinn's cloth with his flowers and carve into his headstone. Here lies Quinn, a bright beacon of hope for the future stolen from us too soon. So why? Because there are people I love that I need to protect and I will protect them. I place Jason's cloth on top of his flowers and carve on his headstone. Here lies Jason, the best friend I ever had and a loving brother up until the end. As I finish wiping my tears, Teresa stands beside me. I like the answers you have chosen. I take it you agree to come with me tonight, then? Yes, I have chosen my answers. Now I have to see them through. I stand to face Teresa with a new sense of conviction. I can't change the past, but I can't stop this from happening again. I need to take action now and help Teresa. There will be time to mourn later. Follow me, then. It's not dragon scale, but I made you something to keep you safe. Teresa guides me around the bend and reveals a set of gray armor. Wow. Did you make this? What is this made out of? Stone? I did, Teresa exclaims proudly. I cut it from the same slab of mountain rock that I used to make your friend's headstones. I had to guess your measurements, but I think I did a good job. Put it on and tell me how it fits. I could make some adjustments if it's too loose or too tight, and I could smooth the joints out more if they feel rough. She watched in anticipation as I put the rock armor on. I thought for sure that this would be way too heavy for me to carry, but it feels oddly light. I say, slipping the hulking flab of stone that is my chest plate over my head and resting it on my shoulders. My blood has made you stronger. Even so, if it starts becoming heavy, tell me immediately. You only just regain consciousness, and I don't want you overexerting yourself. Does it fit? She gives the chest plate a few quick jabs as I ask. The impact of her punches still nearly knocks me to the ground, but my chest isn't caved in, so I think the armor is doing its job. It fits great. I don't feel a thing. Good. You may be stronger, but you are not any more durable. This should be too much for a wolf near to crunch. Teresa says proudly, admiring her work as I put my arms and legs into the suit. What do I use as a weapon, then? I actually have no weapon for you. I do not want you fighting. I just need you to keep close so I can keep you safe. You're kidding me. Shouldn't I at least have some kind of weapon, just in case? Anything to defend myself with. If the need occurs, you could always use your shield to beat the wolf near back until I come to save you. Toby, you are not as strong as me. I do not want you to get into a fight you cannot win. I know you wish to avenge your friends, but tonight is not the night. Just please, stay close to me and stay safe. She stares intensely at me as she makes her plea and I can't refuse. I don't really have much of a say in the matter anyways, do I? I can't make myself a giant stone sword. I'll play it safe tonight, learn, and then when I am healthy enough, I could join you in the fight. I give Teresa a nod and, though she still looks concerned, she returns the gesture and we were off into the woods as the sun disappears behind the horizon. We start off the night patrolling around, but soon the howling begins. Teresa takes off at superhuman speeds towards the sound of the howling, as I struggled to keep up. If she wasn't pulling me by the arm, I'd probably surely tripped or crashed into a tree by now. We make it to a steep part of the mountainside. We find the source of the howling to be five wolf near surrounding the shadow of a figure that is throwing them meat. Our arrival captures the attention of the shadowy figure, 
It slowly starts walking towards us. Teresa releases my arm and pats my chest plate to make sure it's not going anywhere. She quickly draws her weapon and assumes a defense stance. This is bad. Be on your guard. She whispers moments before the first wolf near turns its head towards us. The beast let out a bone-chilling growl, and the four other creatures lock their eyes onto us. In a flash, the battle has begun. The beasts once again charge our way. Teresa runs headlong to meet them, and in a blink is behind the pack holding the tail of one in her left hand. She yells as she throws the entire beast at the shadowy figure, who barely manages to dodge the improvised projectile. The other four will near and circle Teresa, and she stands on guard, waiting for the first move. The wolf near to her back attempts to strike first, but Teresa turns and thrusts the sword directly in its path at the monster's lungs. It, screw it screwers itself onto her sword, and she pulls her blade from the beast's neck before returning to her stance. From behind the shadowy figure, I see the tossed wolf near from earlier start the rise. It shakes its head, but instead of finding Teresa, the beast spots me instead. It breaks into a full sprint towards me and breaks Teresa's concentration. She tries to rush to intercept the wolf near barreling towards me, but the three surrounding her seize the opportunity. The one in front of her catches Teresa with a swipe of its pawn and sends her flying into its accomplice, who slams her to the ground, pinning her. She stabs through the skull of the beast, pinning her, but now the wolf near charging at me is too close for her to reach me in time. I plant my shield to the ground and brace as best I can. The Wolvenir crashes full force into my shield and sends us both flying. I can hear the sounds of Teresa's struggle as I rise to my feet. Hold on! I'll be right there! She shouts in between the sounds of grunting and growling. I look over and see the Wolvenir rising to its feet again. I decide to take the initiative this time and charge the monster's shield first before it could get oriented. My shield slams into the beast and knocks its head into a nearby tree. It struggles to get back on its feet, and I use that moment to slam the wolf near's head between my shield and the tree. The beast let out a howl of pain, and I slam its head again. It grunts and collapses on the ground, and I slam its head again. I could hear the cracking of stone. With all my strength, I bring my shield over my head, and I slam it down on the broken creature's skull one last time. With a satisfying crack, the wolf near's skull caves in and my shield breaks into multiple pieces. I hear footsteps rushing towards me. Before I could turn my head, I am swept up in a hug and spun around in the air. Teresa carefully sets me down with tears of joy running down her face, and she sprints past the wolf near corpses she left behind. She swings her sword with killing intent at the shadowy figure, but as it makes contact, both of them are repulsed from each other. Teresa goes hurling into the forest while the figure slams into the mountainside. The creature speaks a language unlike anything I had ever heard before noticing me. It presses something on its neck as it casually steps towards me. What is the matter, you overgrown lizard? Stuck in awe by our latest technology? Yes. While you brutes rely on the same old tricks, we learn, adapt, and advance. The figure's voice is hoarse, as if it had not spoken in decades. When it steps closer to me, the figure's cocky demeanor falls, and it sniffs the air. Wait, you are not a reptile at all. You are a mammal. A human. Why are you in the clutches of a lizard? The figure finally reaches me, stopping six feet apart just barely in the moonlight. Its skin is sickly gray, and it almost looks transparent. Its eyes are milky white, yet they are focused intently on me. It had no nose or ears, just holes in its head where the nose and ears should belong. Its arms reach down to its knees, and it stands about 5'10". Its body is covered in what looked like circuits and modifications. Its legs are largely mechanical and look hydraulic while its arms look like Swiss army knives. Human, I asked you a question. It hisses impatiently at me. 
Why are you with the lizard? Do you even know her true form? Yes, I know what she is. I'm with her because she saved me from your godless abominations. You killed my friends. You're the Underdweller who created these things that killed my friends. Underdweller. The lizard has already been spewing her filth and filling your head with lies. Human. My race has a much more dignified name. We are the Monumentals. We have existed eons. We are not here to hunt you, but to protect ourselves. The Underdweller looks off into the woods before approaching closer. The lizards discovered our race centuries ago. They greeted them diplomatically and even welcomed them into the capital of our civilization. We trusted them to be civil, but when they laid eyes upon our massively advanced technology, the lizards determined us to be a threat. They laid waste to our capital, killed our leaders, and scattered us to the corners of the world. It was only when we discovered their weakness that we could counterattack. We drove them into hiding and then, satisfied, we returned to our domain as well. In that time, we opened the world to allow you to evolve and reach the top of the food chain. Now that you are so numerous, the dragons have latched a new plan against us. The Underdweller began to circle me. Look at you. Look at what it dressed you to be. A soldier. The lizards want to use the humans as their own personal army against us. They seek to eradicate us so they could reclaim their place as Earth's top predator and enslave the human race. The thing stops in front of me, staring me down with those milky eyes. No, you want to hunt them down so you can use their blood and bodies to make weapons. Teresa told me everything. You created these monsters. How am I supposed to believe that you are the victim here? I could feel my anger welling up. I created the wolf near, yes, but not to hunt humans. I fight against the lizard. Look at what she can do. Thousands of years of advancement, and we have only begun to scratch the surface of matching her lizard brute strength. I am sorry about your friends, truly I am, but they were never meant to be attacked. If she hadn't lured my wolf near to you, your friends would still be alive. Stop it. You're not fooling yourself with that bullshit. No need to be vulgar, human. If you do not trust me, trust in your own ancestors. In your history, when have you ever encountered a friendly dragon? In the nights of the old days, fight my kind to save your princesses? Or did they fight the flying scaly menace? Listen to me here, human. She is using you. She gives you her blood to make you docile, easy to command. She convinces you that we are the enemy. Then she sends you to your death to fight us while she laughs behind your back. Help me kill her. I cannot bring your friends back. But if we kill her, my wolf near and I will leave you to return to your peaceful life in your town. I will even purify your blood so that you could live a normal human life again. You will have saved everyone. The Underdweller is suddenly flung against the edge of the cave, with Teresa pressing full force against him. Sparks begin flying as Teresa is violently shocked, but she preserves through the pain raising her sword blade up to the neck of the Underdweller. A bright flash erupts from the Underdweller's waist, and part of its mechanics fall to the ground broken. His eyes grow wide as the electrical field around him begins to fiddle out. I see his arm begin to swindle, but I am too slow to shout. With a gasp, Teresa's grip loosens and her sword drops to the ground. She stumbles a few steps away before collapsing face first on the ground. The Underdweller brushes himself off and walks up to Teresa, pulling a glowing purple dagger from the slight gap between her chest plate and chose. Lizards never learn. One step closer to freedom. The Underdweller turns Teresa over. His hand pulls her head to the side as he prepares to plant the dagger into her neck. Without thinking, I sprint full speed towards her. As the Underdweller strikes, I crash into him and climb on the Teresa. 
His dagger is deflected off of my armor, and I notice Teresa's sword lying next to us. In one swift motion, I pick up her sword and swing it blindly behind me. The swing connects and the Underdweller recoils, holding his torso. You stupid frickin' ape! Fine! If you enjoy being the pet, you can die with your master! The thing pulls out a whistle and blows a low rumbling note. Suddenly, the woods are filled with the howls of Wolf Near, and the Underdweller slinks away into the cave. I pick up Teresa gently, placing her on my shoulder and sprint back to her home. I place her on her bed and check her pulse. She's still alive, but her breathing is shallow and her pulse is faint. I have chosen to sit and protect her no matter what, just as she did for me. I hear howling and snarling all over. Only an hour has passed, but the wolf near had gone rabid after the whistle. Even from the cabin, I could see in the distance the orange glow of fire over my town. I could smell the smoke, the death. For the past hour, I could hear screaming from the town, but now, I only hear the howling. I remembered my phone and turned it on and tried the call, but nobody in my contacts list was answering. Even 911 was unavailable. I took a moment to look over the cliffside and everything was gone. All that could be seen was a few dying fires and the shadows of the wolf near stalking the streets so that they could render anything they catch alive. I am terrified. Terrified for my family and the well-being of everyone I had ever known. Terrified for Teresa and whatever affliction she is battling. Terrified of being left alone, the only one left. I guess this is why I'm writing this. I am too scared to stay alone. Teresa won't wake up. I've prayed to God, but he doesn't answer me. I know you can't help me, but please just talk to me. I'm afraid of being alone. And the howling from the woods is getting closer. Now that they know Teresa is hiding here, the Underdwellers have forsaken any sense of subtlety. I watched as a group of Underdwellers walked into town escorted by their twisted abominations. They seemed to be occupying it. I can't figure out why they would be interested in it, but I see they have returned electricity to my town and that the internet is working again. My best guess is that they don't know how to access our communication systems with their own technology so they have to use ours instead. They have sent new monstrosities beyond just the wolf near. These new creatures, I've settled on calling behemoths, shake the earth with every stomp. I haven't had a look at the behemoth yet. I have only felt the quakes and heard the roars. Alongside them, winged bat-like creatures have begun circling the area as scouts. They shriek in extremely high-pitched volumes, and swarm at the sight of prey. They lift whatever they find into the air, and in a frenzy rip it the shreds so fast it would make piranhas quiver in fear. The poor grizzly bear never stood a chance. I fashioned a car together using nails and boards. Teresa must have made us spares for her home. I am too afraid to leave her a home alone in the shack, but we still need food and water. The monsters are less active during the daytime, so I've been wheeling her to and from the river to catch what fish and game I can. I could only go for small game. I fear the scent of blood would attract the creatures to my location. I've been working up the courage to plan our escape, and I think tomorrow is the day. The shipping truck will be coming in, and I plan to get us onto it and run to the outside world. As I was making preparations for tomorrow, I heard a soft growl from behind me. I turned immediately and saw Teresa was beginning to stir. My heart flustered with joy as I rushed over to Teresa to help her up. You're alive. Teresa, you've been gone for so long, I didn't know, I couldn't tell. It will require so much more than a stab to the ribs to slay this warrior, she smirked. As we tried to lift her to a sitting position... 
The pain on her wound flared. She growled as I slowly tried to lift her up, but the pain must have been excruciating. Her eyes grew fierce and she flung me off of her with one arm. I went soaring into the wall and she continued to pick herself up. With a yell that shook the whole shack, she rose to her feet. Her eyes filled with red and an immense energy emitted from her. Even without being able to see it, I could feel the power she was exerting. It was terrifying. When she had finally risen to her feet, I felt the power fade back into her. She let out an exhausted sign and turned to me. Where are my sword and armor? Her eyes have returned to normal, the red pupils now again their normal stunning emerald. She seemed to be the same Teresa as before, but her actions felt off. Over in the corner, I had to remove them so I could bandage your wound. I looked down at her side and see that the stab wound that I had been bandaging was now fully healed. Not even a scar remained in the spot where the wound once existed. The wound didn't even heal a bit when I was caring for her. I looked back up towards her gaze. It was not the wound that ailed me. It was the venom of the dagger used. She stated calmly as she turned to inspect her armor. So this is the weak spot, I see. When bent in this position, it opens a gap just wide enough. She mutters to herself while adjusting her armor in different angles, looking for different vulnerabilities. I don't know what to do except to wait for her to be finished. After taking several mental notes, she turns back to me. Upgrades should not take long, but I need to know the situation. What is the status of the village? How long have I been asleep? Enough to cause you alarm? What does not bode well? Teresa speaks unlike her normal self. This Teresa, as a matter of fact, no hope, no cheer, and I began to wonder if the venom she spoke of on that knife damaged her brain, or if she is showing her true nature. You've been asleep for almost a month. The town, everyone, it's all been raised. I haven't seen any signs of life since the night you were hurt. The Underdwellers have deployed more kinds of monsters, and they even have slipped into town and are using things in there. The electricity was out for about a week, but now it's been restored, and the internet is connected again. I think they are trying to gather intelligence on humans. I give Teresa all the information I can think of, but when I look at her in the face again, she only has one question. Everyone is dead? She stands firm but from her unflinching expression, tears flow like waterfalls down her face. I cannot say for sure, but they seem to search the houses for us. I don't think there was anyone spared, I reply, feeling an icy grip in myself as I state the reality I've been hiding from all this time. I dedicated myself to caring for Teresa, but at the same time, I used that fixation to avoid having to confront the truth. Everyone I once knew is gone. I see. So there is no rescue to perform. It's already too late. Her armor slips from her fingers and slaps onto the heavy thud against the floor. Her knees give out and she stares blankly into the floor while teardrops still fall from her face. I finally recognized why it seemed like she was acting strange. She was acting as general preparing for battle. But by the time she arrived the battle was already over and everyone's lost. Centuries of guardianship destroyed in an instant. I got back up and kneeled down in front of her. I held her and she returned my embrace, and together we let out our plan. After a long while, her grip on me loosened and we both sat on the floor facing each other. I don't know what I am to do with myself anymore, Teresa said in a broken whisper. Though the centuries were short, I had grown so attached to your people. I loved their kindness, their cuteness, and how much life they lived in so little time. I had made it my purpose to protect them until the day the Underdwellers attacked humanity. Instead, my presence instigated the Underdweller attack, which resulted in them being all slain. How am I to move forward, Toby? How do I breathe with this guilt which tightens like a vice around my neck and chest? I think hard about the questions that she asks and for a while we sit in silence until I realize I already know the answer, and so does she. How do I live with this guilt? 
She taught me how to live with it, how to keep moving regardless of it. You must make a new vow, a new purpose to pursue. Think about the actions you could do to give justice to the life's lost. Live to bring justice for those who have been stolen from us. We must not allow the underdwellers to go unpunished. I said in Revelation, the spark of inspiration is ignited inside me. To punish the underdwellers, to bring justice to the lost, I can do that. But when it is all done, my problem rises again. What purpose do I serve beyond that? Her eyes are closed as she speaks. I think you are asking the wrong species, unfortunately. Many humans go their whole lives without even knowing what their purpose may serve. But some questions do not have answers. When the time comes, when all of this is said and done, we may need to make our own answers once more to any questions that still remain. For now, I will say I have one suggestion, though. I think I recall something about you cursing me with an extended lifespan. And I know I'm going to need your help to pull off this new immortal lifestyle without getting caught. I wish I had a better answer for her, but this was the best that I could do. I hope deeply that the words that revived my spirit can rekindle hers as well. I stared her to gauge her reaction, to see if her spirit is burning bright within her. Teresa takes in a deep breath and releases a long sigh. Her somber expression finally cracks just the slightest bit as the saddest smile I've ever seen slowly spreads across her lips. Yes, you are quite right about one thing. She shifts onto her knees and raises herself back standing up. I asked the wrong species, that is clear. She let out a light chuckle. Yet yeah, you do well in helping me solve my doubts. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Teresa. I said, raising back to my feet myself. What are you thanking me for? You are strange. Teresa giggles again, and I can't help but laugh with her. I don't know how to articulate it to her, but I am simply just thankful for her. With renewed sense of purpose for both of us, I get to explaining to Teresa the plan I had made to escape the town. She seemed reluctant to leave. Her sense of duty still remained strong inside her. But the town is gone. We will have better chances getting public attention and coming back here with reinforcements than try to take on this all by ourselves. Shortly after finishing my explanation, she looks to the sky. We have until noon tomorrow to prepare to reach the point for reinforcements then, correct? What time is it currently? Time? Let me see. I check my phone quickly. Almost 1 p.m. Perfect. I can be finished before dusk. Follow me down the steps. She pulls me by the arm. Steps? Is your head okay? You don't have a second story, Teresa. I question as she drags me to the middle of the house. She smirks back at me and kicks aside the carpet in the center of the floor, revealing a hatch. You have a basement? Why didn't you use that to hide me in when I was injured? Or when the wolf near attacked here? Teresa rolls her eyes at my questions. The basement, though, the entire time. If we were going to be hiding from creatures with animalistic senses of smell, being underground seemed like a great place to be. If I kept you down here longer than 15 minutes, you would die from a heat stroke, Teresa said matter-of-fact. I didn't understand what she meant at first, but I learned quickly as we got deeper. At the end of the steps stood a giant slab of a stone door. Teresa gripped the hands of the door with both hands, and with much strain she pushes the door open. The wave of heat that followed nearly knocked me out. If you value your skin on your bones, you will stay here. She pokes me in the chest to emphasize her point, before slipping past the small gap she made between the door and the wall. I leaned over a bit to glimpse through the door, and beyond it I see the most brilliant white fire I have ever laid my eyes on. It was as though someone had gone and plucked the flare from a neutron star and placed it here. As I gazed into the flame, suddenly Teresa's face eclipsed it, causing me to jump back. If you stared it too long, it will make you blind, she said with a cheerfulness that made it hard to tell if she was joking or being serious. She took an old leather strap with some notches carved into it and began wrapping it around my arm. What is that? 
That is no normal fire, I say, still enchanted in the mystery of the white flame. Correct. It's not a normal fire. It is my fire, the last fire I breathed before disguising myself in this form. It bears a piece of my soul, and such will burn eternal unless I snuff it out. She now measures around my waist and shoulders. It is the only thing capable of shaping dragon scales, which is why I need to keep it nearby. I will be making some upgrades to my armor before the mission tomorrow. I have never encountered one of those behemoths before. The winged ones, Vrax we call them, I have encountered. The most difficult part about fighting them is simply reaching them. The large one is the new weapon, however, and in such a case I must be prepared. I have also been made aware of an opening in my armor that must be closed. It will be a busy day and I must start immediately if I want any sleep. So off with you. Shout if you need me. With that, Teresa begins to shut the enormous stone door. One thing I forgot to mention. I don't know why you would ever get such an idea, but just to be safe, never touch my fire. The pain the fire burns into those it contacts remains for the rest of their lives. That would be a very long time for you to be burning, and some even speculate the flame permanently burns the very soul. So who is even sure if even death is an escape? She flashes a smile towards me, and once again I can't tell if she's charming or threatening. Just be safe, Toby, and I'll be finished in a flash. Teresa says, finally slamming the door shut. The temperature of the basement hallway instantly drops from surface of the sun levels to volcano levels. While Teresa is sealed inside her makeshift furnace, I wonder what to do in the meantime. At the very least, I don't have to worry about her anymore. She seemed to heal extremely quickly, both physically and emotionally. I still am trying to make sense of her actions earlier, though. Why did she throw me off so violently? She didn't even seem conscious of the fact that she even threw me, either. Her eyes, too. There were so many questions I still have. But they will have to wait, though. I decided to utilize my time going over some of the finer details of the plan. I went to Teresa's telescope to check out the condition of the town. Most of the buildings still seemed to be intact although some are burnt out and others flattened. I try to avert my scope from the dark stains that litter the streets and windows. I purposefully avoid looking at my house. I know what I'll see there, and I do not want to have to witness it. First good news is there's no behemoth lurking around. Hopefully, it only comes out at night. The store is on the other side of town. If we follow the path to the road, we could duck into a house if anything gets too close. Most of the lights I see in homes are centered around the business section of town, likely where most of the office computers are. If we stick to the far side of the residential section, we could avoid the more active areas until the very end. Then, we make the mad dash for the store when we see Justin pulling in with the delivery truck. The sun starts to set, and I make my way back down to Teresa's house. Looking around, it seems like she's still hard at work. So I quickly visit some of the fishing lines I left out and managed to bring a couple of fish catches back for dinner. As if she could smell me cooking, Teresa comes bursting from the hatch right as the stew was done cooking. It would be a true blessing if you made a bowl for me as well, Teresa says, peering over my shoulder at the pot. Well, you wouldn't be a goddess if you weren't blessed now, would you be? I joke as I pour a small portion into a bowl and hand her the rest in the pot. Teresa's eyes glisten, and with no hesitation, she begins devouring the stew right as she stands. I take my bowl and carefully step around her as the first half of the pot vanishes before she even takes a breath. So, how's the upgrading going? Thirsty work, I bet. I chuckle as I take a seat at the table. Teresa seemed that she had remembered that she had company, and sheepishly grabs a spoon and brings her pot over to the table. Look for yourself. She gestures as she leans her torso over to the side. Where once would have existed a slight gap in the armor now lies a finely woven stretch of chainmail. It's not as sturdy as my whole armor, but it does not reduce my flexibility, and it will stop any further attempts to plunge a blade into my side. She demonstrates by trying to stab herself with a spoon. Very impressive. Have you worked on anything else? 
It seems like you were down there for a long time. Granted, I don't know how long it would take to make such a chainmail. It requires a fair amount of time, which is the reason I insisted on beginning my work immediately. But no, it wasn't the only work I had made for today. However, that project is not yet finished. You will have to wait until I'm done for me to show it to you. You shall not rush perfection. She flashes a smug smile at me. In only a couple minutes, her pot is completely empty. No time to waste. Back to work I go. Teresa rushes back down the stairs, slamming the hatch behind her. With night approaching, I hope the noise doesn't attract any unwanted attention. But at the same time, with Teresa awake again, I feel much less afraid as I had been for the past few weeks. The exhaustion of it all catches up to me, and I find myself falling asleep the second I laid down. I wake up the next day and open my eyes to a bright and shiny set of armor on a surprisingly well-crafted armor stand, right in front of me. I guess Teresa was eager to show off her hard work on improving her armor, among the addition of chainmail between each joint of the armor, a freshly made helmet sits atop the stand. I always thought that she could use a helmet out in battle. It seemed reckless to leave the head of all places unprotected. With impeccable timing as always, Teresa walks in the door with three rabbits in her fist. You have awakened. Excellent. Tell me your thoughts. She eagerly awaits my response as she skins the rabbits of their pelts. It's incredible. The chainmail is so finely woven. You would think it was one single flexible cloth. The helmet is a good choice, too. I don't know how strong your skull is in human form, but I imagine taking hits to the head still isn't very good for you. I think you will be even more unstoppable than you were before. Teresa giggles at my comments, and it takes me a moment to realize why. Looking her way again, I notice she is wearing her armor, and her sword is sheathed with her. I look again at the armor set before me. I appreciate your admiration. It was difficult crafting it in such little time, but you are soft and weak. I knew to protect you, I would have to make something that will last longer than the stone. This time, I will also entrust you with a weapon, but on the condition that you must remain defensive in combat. If I observe you becoming careless, or too emboldened by your newfound robustness, I will take back the sword until you can be humble. Teresa puts the rabbits to cook and comes to sit besides me. Teresa, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. This is beyond incredible. I find myself overwhelmed as I touch the smooth surface of the chest plate. Say nothing more about it. I simply just did what needed to be done to protect the one I have sworn to protect. She pats me on the back. Have you tried putting it on? I want to be sure the measurements are correct. Teresa takes the helmet off the stand and plops it onto my head. It's an excellent fit. It holds up steady without feeling like it's constricted my head or any other movement. I haven't had a chance to try it, but the helmet feels perfect, thank you. I wrap Teresa in a bear hug, and she jokingly pats me on the helmet. I am pleased to hear it. To answer your earlier question, that helmet will stop nothing that my skull cannot. My kind's bones and scales grow stronger with age. Therefore, if I wish to, I could crack that helmet with a good headbutt. These are made of my scales when I was young, still stronger than any other substance known to me, but not stronger than my current strength. The only thing that I know that could crack my armor would be an elder dragon, but none of my kin would turn against us. Doing so would be death of our species. Well, if the armor could only be broken by that of a dragon, I say that's strong enough for me. I chuckle before a question rises within me. I know you said before that you're not exactly a dragon. You use the term for my sake so I don't get confused. But what do you call yourself? Trovenir. That is the name of our people. The ancients who walked this planet before all others... We ruled in relative peace until the day the Monumentals emerged from below. Teresa's expression became pained as she recalls the memories of the Underdwellers. Can you help me get the rest of this armor on? I suggest, trying to change the subject. Moi? Oh, well, of course. 
If it needs any adjustments, speak clearly and I shall fix it accordingly. Teresa jumps up, pulling off my helmet and slamming the chest plate onto my shoulders. Ah, uh, a little more gentle, please. I wince as the impact of the armor shocks my entire skeleton. Oh dear, please excuse me. I must remember you are fragile. She gently pats my shoulder while she fastens the chest plate to me. I like to think of it more like you're ridiculously strong. I joke, slipping my legs into the chassis. If it preserves your ego, you may continue to believe that. There. Now, do you feel fit? Now, how does that full set feel? Teresa eagerly jumps back to admire her work. Feels absolutely perfect. Thank you again, Teresa. I do a few stretches to test everything out, but the armor feels simply like a second layer of skin. It feels natural to be in. I am pleased to hear it. Now set. We must eat, then we must move. Do not forget what day it is. Teresa brings over the cooked rabbits, and we both begin eating without hesitation. In all the excitement, I had momentarily forgotten about what day it was. Today is the day we escape the Underdwellers, and finally feel safe for the first time in what felt like a lifetime. Teresa finishes eating quickly, and wastes no time getting into her armor and grabbing her sword and shield. As I rush to finish the last bit of food, she hands me her shield. I did not have time to make another. The stone shield I carved for you did not seem to suffice last encounter either. Be sure to treat this shield carefully. If you lose it, I will not have a replacement. Can't you make another? Not that I'm going to lose it. I won't. But are shields that hard to make? I ask her feeling the weight of the shield grow as she leaves it in my hands. Shields are not difficult to make, no. Rather, they're time-consuming to make. My true issue would be the lack of supplies. After we leave here, I will not have my scales to create replacements. I could not hide my existence long if we arrived in your new settlement carrying scales of a dragon. Teresa heads towards the door with a resolve as I took a moment to steal myself. Okay. We can do this. Get through town, get to the truck, get out of Dodge. Most importantly, do not lose that damn shield. With my objectives reaffirmed in my head, I picked up my sword on the laptop bag as we head into the woods. The first steps are smooth sailing. The forest gives a lot of cover and the sunlight seems to be keeping most of the monsters indoors. Once we emerge from the woods, all signs of life vanish. No sound can be heard besides the sly crunching and cracking of gravel and the jingle of our armor as pieces shuffle within our movements. We stick close to the houses, ready to dash inside at any sight of danger. As we make our way down the street, a footprint has created a crater within the road. The foot alone was easily the length of my body, and the former ford flattened into sheet metal within the print tells me all I need to know about the strength of the monster. As I suspected, all forms of vehicles I saw were destroyed. Not even bicycles were spared. The underdwellers do not want any risk of us escaping. We keep moving until we get close enough to the edge of the residential district. Just a dash down this lane, and we would be diving into the business district and towards the grocery store. The town is still silent, Everything in my being is shouting at me that it's not right. Are the Underdwellers nocturnal? I mean, it would make sense, since they are subterranean creatures. Would they truly be so bold as to not have any guards whatsoever, though? They wouldn't even need to guard it themselves. They have creatures to use at their whim. I looked over to Teresa, and she points at herself, then at her head. Then she points at both of us and points forward. I know. We keep moving forward. She's smart. She learns and adapts quickly. Maybe when all this is said and done, I'll teach her how to use my laptop so she could understand I'm not just staring at some magical rectangle. Heading into the business section, I see a faint glowing coming from one of the few undamaged stores. I peek my head around the window to see what's causing the light and from inside, I see the underdweller we fought standing in front of a crowd of dozens. 
I thought he was the only one. But he either called in backup or we had the whole colony underneath us. They were using a projector and a computer, giving a lecture not unlike what you'd see from a college professor. On the screen behind him stood an article about the United States, military might. The Underdweller giving the presentation seemed to be translating the writing to the others. I guess they do have speech translators, but they are not exposed to human writing. Or maybe they don't know how to translate writing that is not physical. The Underdweller slowly types, letter by letter, a search for nuclear weapons. He clicks on the first link on the results page and begins lecturing again. I notice his audience seems to be taking notes. He creates a search again and begins typing a search for world military before Teresa tugs at my shoulder. A part of me wants to bust in the door and slaughter every one of those creatures in there, but I know we are outnumbered, and who knows what weapons they possess. Reluctantly, I turn back to Teresa, and we keep pressing forward. We finally reach the store, although it has seen better days. The back half of the store is completely caved in, and the front half is littered with stains. I am not sure if it's cruelty or mercy that there are no bodies left to identify who left the stain. All that remains are some bloodied fragment scraps and thin shards of bone. Teresa looks on in horror and pain at the carnage left of what once was the people she loved to protect. We walk inside and I lead Teresa towards the manager's office. The door is locked, but I remember a spare set of keys kept hidden in the janitor's closet. I once helped the shopkeeper, Mr. Chang, from when I helped clean up after Jason got really sick and vomited all down the aisle. He was trying to make it to the bathroom, but he didn't get there in time. I felt really bad, leaving it up to older Mr. Chang to clean up by himself. I once asked why he didn't have Jody take up the store for him, but he said she took up running the store of her uncle who sadly passed away unexpectedly down in Nevada. He offered that if he ever got too old to run the place that he would give me first dibs, if she wanted to move back and me second dibs if she hadn't. As he pulls out a bottle of heavy cleaner, he jiggled it in front of me. He told me, if there is ever an emergency with me or my missus, I need you to take over the store while I'm away. I'll give you a call and you can run everything from my office. As I open the container and dump the key into my hand, I wonder if he did call on that dreaded night, the night the wolf near attacked. Although he must have thought that I was already dead, did he call me in one last attempt for help? The key fits and the door quietly swings open. The inside of the office is pristine, completely unaware of the horrors that raged outside. Teresa and I slip in quietly, shutting the door behind us. I sit in the chair at Mr. Chang's desk and bump into the mouse on the computer. To my utter shock, the screen lights up. Despite being half-wrecked, the building still somehow had power here. I take a mental note to be on the lookout for any live wires on the ground before hurrying to plug in my laptop and phone. I had done my best to preserve their battery life, but both have gotten low. As I finish pulling the chargers from my bag and plugging them into the wall, I glance at the time. 9.12 in the morning. The truck is always scheduled to arrive around noon. I looked out the window and stared down the tree that leaves my town. I feel within me the urge to just bust through the glass and go running down that road. Away from my nightmares, my fears. Run as far away from everything that has tortured me over these past few weeks? Months? I don't even know if I could tell anymore. I don't even remember what day it started. All I know is today is the day it ends. I settle my nerves and find it within me to hold myself back for a little bit longer. I will wait for the truck and I will leave here soon enough. In the closed-off room, Teresa and I feel comfortable enough to whisper to each other. She spends a lot of our time waiting, asking about each and everything we passed along the way here. Questions, I'm sure, may have been burning inside of her for a long time. How do cars work? How do you shape such large rocks with such little strength? How does electricity activate so many things? How do you harvest electricity when there is no lightning? By the end of all of her questions, I had lost track of time. I glance at the clock again. It's one in the afternoon. 
How often is Justin late? He couldn't have been early, and we would have missed him, right? Did I get my days wrong? What if they had already killed him? As Dow began to overtake me, I heard the substal roaring of an engine in the distance. Teresa and I rushed over to the window to see a truck heading up the road towards us. We quickly rush to the door and wave him down as he pulls up next to us. Jesus, what the hell happened here? Y'all look like you were hit by an earthquake. Is everyone okay? What the hell are you wearing and where's Mr. Chang? Justin looks around astonished by the wreckage. I promise, Justin, it's worse than just an earthquake and we need to get in that truck and turn back now. I try to push him back towards the truck. Hold up for a second, Toby. Calm down and talk me through this, okay? Let's start with what happened here. And if anyone needs any urgent medical attention, I got a kid in the back end. Justin, please, we don't have time. We need to go now. Everyone is dead. We are the only ones left. As I plead to Justin to move, a roar that shakes the earth comes from our right. What in the hell? Okay, kid, you win. Get in now. Justin turns to jump back into the driver's seat, but before he could take a step, the behemoth comes charging from down the wood line. It levels trees and buildings in its unstoppable sprint before plowing into the truck, tearing it to scraps. The behemoth had to be about 60 feet high, an ape-like monstrosity with long arms and muscles that would make dinosaurs look flimsy. I had no idea how something so large could hide from us, until I noticed circuitry falling from its body as it rose back to its feet. The beast's image distorted and reappeared for a few moments until the machines finally gave out. With an anguished cry, the behemoth shrank in size before my eyes. The form contracted and twisted until the creature had been reduced to 12 feet tall. The beast looked towards us, eyes filled with rage, and I could feel an arm on my chest pushing me back. Kids, you both run as far as ways you can. I don't think after what we just saw, the bullets are going to stop this thing. Justin unholstered a pistol he had concealed on him. I never knew he carried one. No, hold on, Justin. That thing will kill you. Teresa and I can handle this thing. Trust me, please. You have no idea what's going on here. Teresa speaks up towards Justin. Please forgive Toby. He misspeaks. Teresa herself can fend off the beast. Toby can take you to safety. She steps forwards towards the behemoth and braces herself for its attack. Is that pretend knight armor and sword really going to be enough to fight that thing? Justin looks over towards me for an answer. For her, yeah. For me and you, probably not. Which is why we're going to listen to her and get going. I motion the Justin to follow me and we head towards the back of the store. The behemoth charges at Teresa, but she holds firm. As it collides with her, she digs her heels into the ground and flips it over her, slamming it into the ground. It kicks back at Teresa, unfazed by the hit it just took, and sends her slamming into the wall of the store. Justin and I turn the corner, but the sounds of the scuffle continue. As we look from where to go next, from the power plant comes an enormous dark purple beam, the beam envelops the sky, spreading out and creating a dome around the area. Everything becomes shrouded in darkness, and the howling begins again. I pick a random direction and run with Justin. Unfortunately, because I get turned around in a panic of everything, we ended up running in the direction Teresa and I had come from. In hindsight, I don't know if the result would have changed if we did go another way. The Underdwellers knew that Justin was going to arrive today, and they knew he was the last one who would notice if our town was suddenly vanished. As we ran down the road, we were cut off by three Underdwellers and another behemoth. Without hesitation, Justin fired at the group. His bullets damaged the behemoth's device and struck one of the Underdwellers in the head, killing it instantly. The two remaining Underdwellers were paralyzed in fear until they heard the clicking of Justin's handgun. One signaled the behemoth to charge as the other drew a piece of metal that expanded into a spear. The behemoth charged directly at Justin, but I was able to intercept and tackle it into the building next to us. 
I struggle to hold the behemoth down, but it gets the upper hand, launching me into the ceiling and then punching me across the street. As I try to catch my breath, I can see Justin fighting both the Underdwellers with a piece of rebar. They are trying relentlessly to stab him with their spears, but he manages to pry and dodge each time. Ha! That's fifteen years of fencing you're going up against, you nasty freaks! Justin mocks the easily outclassed Underdwellers as he parries their spear again. This time, he rushes the disarmed Underdweller, keeping his target between him and the second spearman, and slams the rebar into its head. It falls to the ground and he tosses the rebar for the creature's dropped spear. Come on! I'll drive a hole right through your skull! I turn back to see the behemoth charging towards me. I sidestep at the last second, and the beast goes through both walls of the building, caving into the roof. I see from the corner of my eye the Underdweller on the ground summon something from his wrist. In seconds, I hear the shrill shrieks of those damn bats, the Vrax, coming our way. While I am distracted, the behemoth comes bursting through the rubble once again and catches me. It slams me into the ground before tossing me up into the air. As I am soaring, I am caught by the swarm of bats, and they break their teeth trying to take chunks out of me. I struggle to break free as they claw at my armor trying to tear it off. One of their talons rips my shield off the armor, but it frees up my arm. I start swinging wildly, slashing through the bats surrounding me. The bat carrying me struggles to keep height, and as we near the height where I think I could fall and it wouldn't kill me, I tear my sword through its wing, causing us both to plummet back down. The fall is hard and I struggle to try and stand. Before I can even sit up, I feel the fists of the behemoth slamming me back into the ground. It strikes again and again and I am pinned, unable to stop the barrage of attacks. Toby, catch! Justin throws Teresa's shield as it bounces off the head of the behemoth, grabbing its attention. Shit, I should have played more baseball. Come at me, big, hairy, and ugly. Justin readies his spear as the behemoth roars him. Justin, no! Dodge! You can't fight it! The behemoth charges at Justin with all its power. Neither can you, kid! Justin thrusts the spear into the behemoth's thigh as it collides into him. They both go rolling into a utility pole, which snaps and falls on top of Justin's leg. He screams in pain as both his legs are crushed. I rush over to help him as the behemoth pulls the spear from its leg. Stop, Toby. I have played hero with you, but I think the game is over for me now. I'm sorry, kid. As the behemoth rises again, Justin grabs it and grabs the loose wire next to him. With a sickening crackle of electricity, both Justin and the behemoth are electrocuted. I watch, powerless to help as Justin sizzled until the spasms of the behemoth body knocked them both loose. Sorrow and rage flood me once again as I see the Underdwellers attempt to flee. I pick up Teresa's shield before I rush one down and tear my sword through its back. The second one calls another flock of piranha bats to come pick him up. I ready my shield to throw and knock him down, but Teresa flashes past me. In a single leap, she cleaves every bat in the sky purposefully, leaving the Underdweller untouched as he crashes back down to Earth. With one swift strike, she removes the head from the Underdweller's shoulders. Do not be so careless with the things that do not belong to you, she says, restrapping the shield tight to my arm. She glances over to the dead behemoth and sees the burnt body of Justin. Her face sinks and her eyes close for a moment as she remains still. When she reopens her eyes, her look of fierce determination has returned as she pulls me back towards the store. We must leave now. The wolf near are all flooding the village, and if they catch us, I will not be able to fight them all. She picks up the pace, and we won't stop until we're at the front of the door again. We must hide as best we can. The blood will cover our scent. As Teresa reaches for the door handle, she pauses again. She turns to face me. He was kind and selfless, Justin. I liked him. Those beasts are a far more difficult enemy than you could have ever encountered even in their smaller state. 
You did your best, and I'm sure, but nothing could have prepared you for that brute strength. You are not responsible. I will make an exception on taking back my sword this once, since the Underdwellers were once combatants. You must not use it for any offensive tool again, especially not as a tool for revenge. This is the only exception I will make. She attempts to make a stern look, but her eyes are full of sympathy. Uh, thank you, Teresa. It won't happen again. Although, I'm beginning to wonder how many of my friends can die before me until I am responsible for their death. I reach past her for the door, getting us both inside before quietly locking it behind us. The once pristine carpet now stained with the red dripping off our armor. From our swords drips the pale blood of the Underdwellers gathered in a pool beside both of us. Again, it feels like a last bit of peace and normalcy I had to cling to has been tainted. The last person from my life before this, gone as quickly as we were reunited. I shut the blinds over the window, and shoved the desk up against to it to keep the prowling wolf near from seeing any movement inside. I could hear the howling all around me. The howling that has taken my town, taken the last piece of my old life left. There are so many Wolvenir out there. I am out of ideas once again. I didn't come with the plan B. Teresa sits at the ready, but I don't have a clue how we're getting out of this. We are trapped in here now. There is no escape from this town. The only thing left to do is fight. So we take the offense if we survive the night. This is Teresa. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. I am the Trovenir who has selflessly taken Toby under her wing. That is pronounced Trovanir. I know humans have a difficult time adapting to languages not their own. Toby has shown me how to use this machine, but I must admit I don't think I fully understand how it works. Regardless, he said in anticipation of the time of his injury that I must send you all a letter chronicling our events. He said humans are pack animals, and that they gain strength from sharing information with each other and fighting together. If that man had listened to me as well as I listened to him, I wouldn't need to write this letter for him. But he has shown to be reckless when it comes to trying to protect others. Although I cannot fault him for that, I suppose as I am much the same. However, I told him that even though he now possesses my blood, he is not as durable as me. Though knowing this fact, that man still throws himself in front of the fist of the behemoth for me. I would have likely been relatively uninjured. At the least, I would have been unconscious and had to be dragged home to be taken care of once again. I tell you, I spend more time caring for this man unconscious than I do when he is conscious. He worries me, though. You understand, right? Seeing the ones that you care about get hurt, it is an unbearable pain. I have been alone for so long. I do not wish to be alone again. That is why I have taken such dramatic measures to preserve the spark of life within this silly little man. As it is, I fear how much my interventions have morphed him. It worries me that what I had to do to revive him this time may have changed him. I don't know if the person who wakes up will be the Toby I know. I am forgetting my purpose here. How do I erase previous entries? I am pressing the delete button, but it doesn't seem to delete what I want. How do I make it go backwards? No matter. We will hope Toby does not read this letter. Besides, it is rude to spy on writings between two individuals. Allow me to take upon Toby's duty in his absence. I have read his last correspondence, so I am up to speed with where you all are. I have seen your responses as well, and they are all very sweet. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the kind words and support. Yet here I stand, distracted again. Now I shall get to the point. We were trapped in that office for a good many hours before the wolf near stopped their stalking and their numbers thinned. In a gap between underdweller patrols, Toby and I decided to make a run for it. I suggested we retreat back to my home. Toby instead wanted to go deeper into the building and loop towards the village power supply. 
We might be able to shut this bubble down if we could knock out whatever they are using to feed it, he said. I was unsure of his plan, but I did not want to cause him further alarm by letting him know what the dome is. The dome is a call for death. The Underdwellers activate them when one of my kind has been discovered in the area. I have seen them before on the day they attacked. Inside these domes, the Underdwellers unleash their most secret of abominations. Entire communities are swallowed inside, and no longer have they been seen or heard. Nothing escapes those walls, and on the exterior, they display a sickening illusion of peace and emptiness where the slaughter is occurring. They use this dome to shroud their crimes, so that the cries for help may never reach a savior's ears. I do not know what powers these cowards' weapons. I believe it is something greater than humans' production. Regardless, I have followed Toby towards the power plant. I hoped at the least we may be able to disrupt something of enough significance to allow us to escape back to safety. We did not make it that far. As we progressed through the village, patrols of the Underdwellers grew tighter, and leaving a trail of bodies would lead them straight to us. We had been lucky with the buildings that we picked for hiding, yet our luck ran out. With our target in sight, we hid inside a building being used for a vrac nest. The moment we entered, they sounded the alarm, and our stealth had been shattered. In the enclosed space, I had little trouble jumping up and cutting through all the vrac, but the damage was already done. Wolfnir came crashing in through the windows and doors. I slashed my way down the hall towards the rear exit of the building, as Toby held his own against a couple of the Wolfnir. As I rushed back to grab him, we could feel the rumbling already getting closer. Toby picked up something, quickly stuffing it into his pocket before I grabbed him, and we ran out the rear door. Not a second passed after we crossed the threshold before the building was reduced to rumble. A behemoth. It was at maximum height, and I could see the Underdwellers wasted no time upgrading the beast's growth tool. It was now implanted subdermally, meaning bringing it back down to size would no longer be a simple task. As I readied myself to face the behemoth, I commanded Toby to flee back home. If I took the attention away from him, he would be able to make it safely. He refused, because he lacks a sense of self-preservation, and insisted on fighting at my side. I really must remember to lecture him on the importance of listening to wisdom. Please, if it is not mentioned by the next letter, do remind me to put that man back in the realm of reality. I will admit, before he refused to leave, I had never been more tempted to revert back to my Trevnir form. I doubted my ability to best such a large beast without my full strength. I entertained the idea of fighting one last battle, wiping out all the Underdwellers or die trying. But either outcome Toby would escape. Instead, he stayed, and I was no longer allowed the foolish notion of framing my death as my own heroic self-sacrifice. I know, unleashing my Travnir form is my death sentence. The second I give in to my desire to unleash, I will never be able to return to hiding. I will be hunted until I am slain, and I swore never to leave Toby alone. I don't know if he realizes his courage or foolishness. He saved me from making that decision many times since the fall of the village. I had no other option but to fight. I commanded Toby to fight the approaching Underdweller, and I charged towards the behemoth. With my speed, I was able to duck under the monster's stomp, and with a quick twirl, I slashed both the tendons on the back of his feet. It fell to its knees, and I was able to begin climbing up its back. The monster's arms were too large to reach behind it. It was not a very flexible foe. But as I approached the base of its spine, the beast fell backwards into the attempt to flatten me. Now on its back, I was able to climb towards its chest, where the purple glow of the Underdweller's technology could be seen radiating from its sternum. In an unusually swift motion, the beast was able to knock me out of it, and I was sent like an arrow into the buildings. I rose to find Toby struggling with three wolf near that had encircled him. The Underdweller was wounded, leaking its shiny pale blood but still standing. 
I leapt into the encirclement, shoving Toby to the floor, and with a spin, two wolf near were now blinded, and the third stumped to the ground as the upper half of its skull threw into the underdweller's head. In my quick rescue, I had allowed the behemoth to recover, and it now crawled towards us. I ran to meet it halfway and keep the battle as far away from Toby as possible. As I readied myself, a swarm of rack came rushing by, and in a moment of distraction, the behemoth grabbed me and hoisted me up. The beast tried to crush me with its immense strength, but I was able to force a gap in its palm by pushing against it with my knees and back. I wedged my sword into the gap, and as rapidly as I could began cutting. I could feel his grip tightening as the behemoth resisted the pain. Then suddenly it released, and I fell flat into its palm. Shadow loomed over my head, and I saw the behemoth's overhand coming down to flatten me. In one last slash into the palm, I was struck by the force of the other hand, and sent hurling through the monster's flesh and slamming into the ground. The beast roared in anger, and soon a fist was flying towards me. That's when the sweet, lovable, courageous idiot pulled me from the crater I was getting comfortable with, and threw me out of the way. The behemoth's hand came down, and Toby was caught by the strike. Breath did not leave my body until the creature lifted its hand, and I saw Toby was still whole. He was alive, but he was not moving. I could hear his breathing, but it was shallow. He was gravely injured, and I couldn't bear the sight of him broken in front of me, for me. I am ashamed to admit, but I gave in slightly to the temptation of power then. I could feel my blood boil in my veins, the primal rage that fills us when the ones we care about are in danger, my strength enhanced as long as I could keep myself in check. Kicking off the ground, I sent myself shooting into the head of the behemoth, knocking it backwards once again. I ran down its face and plunged my sword into its flesh, rending it from chin to chest. When I reached the place where the instrument had been installed, I was blocked by the sternum. The bastards buried the device not just underneath the skin, but behind the bones as well. Regardless, I brought down my sword as hard as I could, each swing splintering off more and more bone until my sword became lodged into its bone. The added frustration of wasting time to render aid drove me even more feral. I felt my claws regrowing on my fingers, and I did not hesitate to make use of them. Charging back up the behemoth's body, I stopped at the cut I had made on its neck. I used my claws to cut through the soft tissue, quickly severing all but the bone connecting the head to the body. The behemoth tried to grab me, then it simply just tried to hold its head together. I let out a true trovenir roar, and with my true strength, I snapped the vertebrae holding the beast together. It fell limp and I freed my blade out of the body as I immediately ran over to Toby. It was worse than I thought. The mobility I added to our armor allowed for it to flex inward slightly, not enough to let him get flattened by the behemoth, but enough that the impact had caved into his chest. His body was struggling the heel by the tiny splinters of bone that had pierced into every organ. Any normal human would be dead, but even with my blood, I did not know if he would survive. I scooped up Toby, grabbed the sword and the bag he had left strewn about, and as fast as I could ran him back home. When we arrived, his condition was still worsening. Many thoughts were planting seeds in my mind. Why not did he just listen to me? If he had run, he would have never been hurt. I would have survived the blow with much less injury. If I was as injured as he, I would have survived and healed faster. I would have survived. My subconscious shouted at me about my consciousness was trying to deny. I would have survived, but Toby had not survived. His shallow breaths had ceased, and his heart no longer beat. I panicked and tore the armor from him. I tried to pump his heart, to fill his lungs with air, to revive him. I had seen the humans do it once before. His body was still warm, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not get him to breathe again. I was losing time. In desperation, I took him downstairs. If I could make him like me, if I could become one with him, make him a true Travnir, 
Maybe I could still have him. I placed Toby in my flame, my eternal flame. His body instantly caught fire, and I had failed. I wept, and the flames grew in brightness until I could no longer see Toby. He had been reduced to kindling. Or so I thought. The flames started to fade, but Toby remained. And while his clothes, hair, and whites of his fingernails burned in the fire, the fire slowly seeped into his skin. When the last ember faded into him, I touched his chest and found his heart faintly beating. Anything that was dead all the way down to the dead cells had been consumed in my blaze. This means he was not dead. My flame, my soul, had accepted him and now he was no longer human. That is what leads us to now. We remain down here and I await the awakening of Toby once again. I am too fearful to move him elsewhere. I do not want to worsen any injuries that may still be recovering. With all that I have done, I hope that what awakens is still the person he was before. There is no prior knowledge to an event similar to this. A human who has merged with the Travnir soul, I realize, reflecting on my actions, what I did was completely nonsensual. Fire is not known to be healing, and if things had gone wrong, I could have made his last moments even more agonous potentially scorching his very soul for all eternity. I only hope that what awakes is the one I hold dear. I do not know what I would do if I lost him. All I wish for when these hardships are over is to be with him forever. I forget myself again. I pray that you may also forget those last few sentences. They do not concern you, so there is no need for you to concern yourself with them either, yes? Those are the events that have chronicled but I still wish to engage with you all. I have been so curious about you since Toby first mentioned your existence. It is incredible the type of technology you humans come up with. Not even the Underdwellers have created a system of long-distance communication so intricate. If you were them, you would still be using Messenger Vrak. That is not to underestimate the Underdwellers. The technology they have chosen to advance is beyond anything either of us could dream about. I have heard stories from the ones who visited on the day the Underdwellers announced themselves to us. Entire countries established under a dark purple hue. Pads that teleport you great distances simply by entering the unique code for the location you wish to go to. Large drills that run almost silently to expand their underground empires. Even neural links that communicate between them. And things they come in range of. To read a book there... All they had to do was get within arm's length distance of the book, and the information was transferred as fast as lightning. All of that is disregarding their primary focus, war technology. The Underdwellers pride themselves in creating the most demented, savage beasts imaginable. If a creature gets adopted by their military, the Underdweller who spawned the abomination will become royalty. Others are delegated into creating creatures that perform their own needs. Construction, farming, maintenance, childcare. Anything that involves much work is delegated to monstrosities that are created only to serve. It is nothing short of slave labor in Trevenir eyes. To create a living, feeling being for the sole purpose of being a tool. While I must kill the wolf near used to attack me, I do not blame the creatures themselves. They are disgusting, vile, ravenous, and aggressive, but only because they have been created to be such. They are only a fraction of the darkness that lies in the hearts of the Underdwellers. I must feel insane to you humans that such dark and disgusting creatures, hunters of my kin, are terrified of you. It tickles me too, in a way. With Trovnir, they become obsessed with building technology to counter our physicality. Their force shields can bend to the shape of impact, able to withstand immense amounts of pressure, heat, and repulse objects that get too close. A hard target the battle for me, but for your weapons they have nothing. Their force fields shatter when a small mass exerts too much pressure on one point, just like a bullet. In their obsession to kill my kin, they completely overlook the most common of weapons used amongst humans. In addition to that, it is unknown whether their current defenses can withstand explosives. Having lived beneath the surface, 
Underdwellers never developed projectiles or explosives. Setting off explosives underground could even cave in their entire civilization if extreme enough. If you want to talk about extremes, the biggest fear they have of humans is human's nature. Humans do not surrender easily. They are a hopeful species with a mighty resolve. While the variety of humans is vast, humanity also is one of the best species when it comes to uniting to defend each other. Your cooperation, your ambition, your hope all drives fear into the Underdwellers. Having seven billion living members of your species against a few dozen million also helps enormously. I do not know how many Travenir remain, but once we had a few million to our species. For all I know, I may be the last. I must remind myself once again, I was not tasked to be solemn. I am to share information vital to the rise of humanity against the Underdwellers. It has been a pleasure to finally be able to speak with you in Toby's stead. I pray that once Toby and I are free of these ordeals we face, I may get to meet more of you personally. I will see to it that we both survive. There are no more gambits I could take in the case that Toby becomes injured again, so I will not allow him to be injured ever again. That is my promise to you, dear friends within the screen. I hope that you are all well in your own personal struggles. We will run again soon. And next time we do, I assure you we shall bring good news. I feel like the end of this nightmare is soon to come. Until then, take the best of care. Teresa P.S. Do not go jumping into fires to attempt to become a Travnir. It does not work that way. Many thanks. P.P.S. The fuel indicator on this thing is getting low. How do I refuel it? Many thanks again. Before I get started, I am aware of Teresa's shenanigans, and I apologize for whatever she may have written. I would be more specific, but she forbids me to read her post. Even now, she is staring over my shoulder as I type to be sure I don't take a peek. She says, Hello, fine friends. If you value your health, you will keep our personal correspondence between us. Lord knows what she is hiding, but I hope she didn't embarrass us too much. Although there is little more embarrassing than when I woke up, I remember nothing since I last posted. Teresa had to fill me in on what had happened, so you could imagine my shock as I woke up. You live! Before I could process the words. I was tackled by Teresa in a hug so tight a python would be jealous. Are you alright? What do you feel? Please speak. Teresa shook me violently with each question until I could catch enough breath to talk. Teresa? Why am I naked? Upon uttering the question, Teresa's face flushed bright red, and she scooted a couple of steps back. You are injured again. Terribly wounded. Fatally wounded. Her eyes stayed focused on my face as I tried to rearrange myself in a more concealed way. I looked around for something to cover myself with, but unless I was going to hide beneath the scales or inside a wall, there was nothing to use. Fatally? What do you mean? I recovered, right? I am here, unless we both died and this is purgatory. In which case, it's not very fair you get clothed and I don't. I smile at my own joke but I see tears welling up in her eyes, and she pulls me back into her again. You are gone. I was so afraid that you would be gone forever. You are not healing. You are not breathing. Her sobs into my shoulder, and I realize the gravity of the situation as I rub her back gently. I was gone. I had died? How did she... I looked down at the stone I laid upon and finally recognized the room I was in. The forge. It should have clicked with the scales, but there was no fire. Am I where the fire once blazed? Did you try to cremate me? No! Teresa's grip tightened into the force of a black hole, and I instantly regretted my question as I could feel fresh tears run down my back. I did not know what to do. 
You had stopped breathing and human techniques were not working. I thought since you bared my blood, maybe my soul could take purchase within you. I bathed you in my eternal flame and you accepted it, or it accepted you. I don't know which is true, but either way, you became part of me and I a part of you. I feel Teresa's breath start the steady again as she composed herself. You saved me again. I am at a loss for words. I owe you, Teresa, my life so many times over. I have lost count. Not without costs, she whispers. She gently lets off of me again so that she could face me. Your humanity. It is more likely now that you are no longer human. I do not mean an extended lifespan and increased physical attributes either. Your very being has shifted. When you were embraced by my flames, they burned away everything that was not you. Even dead parts of you that were burned away, your hair, your nails. Yet, they have regrown at an unnatural rate for a human. I have saved your face and trimmed your nails once an hour. She raised her hand to my cheek and I instinctively felt my own chin. There is a slight stubble there already. I had shaved this morning, and I know shaving with a knife is more difficult than a razor, but I have gotten pretty good at getting it smooth. I could feel my one short hair now touch the base of my neck. What does this mean? I don't know. My only explanation would be that your body is adjusting to the new power it has received. It is overflowing with energy as it adjusts. She gets close and stares directly into my eyes. Yet your mind and your eyes still remain yours. This is good. You should not transform wildly at the least. Transform into what? A Trafnir. Your new true form. Teresa withdraws her hand and I notice her nails now ending in claws. Small scales encircle her fingers. It is difficult to change back your form. It takes time. If you were to transform, I don't know if you would have the energy mastery over your new powers to revert back. She looks at her own hand and I could see the outmost layer of scales receding slowly back into her skin. So you're saying I'm a Travnir now? How is that possible? You said that wasn't how it worked before. It was not. None have ever done what we have before. None have ever been unharmed by the flame before, except for others of my own kin. Our kin. You sure about this, Teresa? I stare into her eyes, and Teresa gives it a moment of thought before winding up and striking me with full force in my chest. Ow! Shoot, Teresa! I'm not wearing any armor! The realization dawns on me halfway through the sentence. She always told me I was not any more durable. I look up to see her eyes begin to water again. I don't know if I made the correct choice. Please tell me, did I? I did not want to be selfish, but I... I groaned to need you. She was on the verge of tears again. I had never seen her so upset. It was my turn to pull Teresa back in for a hug. I think you did. I'm glad to be with you still. I don't mean to cut it so close. I'm sorry, Teresa. I won't leave you, never again. If it means even sacrificing my humanity, I will stay with you. And so for a while we did stay, just like that. Holding each other until we both felt ready to move forward again. She pulled back again and I broke the silence, thinking carefully how to word my questions so as to not upset her anymore. So how does this power thing work exactly? Yes, that is really the best I could come up with. Our strength can be summoned upon when necessary, but the more you summon, the harder it becomes to retain your human form. Along with that, emotion can amplify our strength, but as emotions do, they can make it harder to think clearly in combat. You will want to be conscious of rage and grief. Both are powerful emotions, and if you were to get lost in them, It would take an emotion filled with more power to release you from your frenzy. When I feel myself losing control, I look upon my happy memories to regain my senses. Happy memories. Well, I have plenty of those to rely on. 
I smile at her, which makes her beam back at me. Are you confident you do? With how much you sleep, perhaps they are all dreams. She pokes her finger into my side. Haha. <laughs> well, if they're all dreams, at least they are good ones. I stood up and Teresa braced herself around my arms in case I fell. My feet hit the floor and I stood perfectly fine. I feel good enough to walk. Let's go upstairs and see if I could find any clothing. At the reminder that I'm still stark naked, Teresa quickly withdraws her face to make it focused effort to keep her eyes at face level. We go up the stairs and search my bag, but I don't have anything of use. We weren't planning on spending the night camping on that fateful day, so I didn't pack a spare set of clothes. At this point, I was wishing Marcus was with us. He would have been the only one to think far enough ahead to pack an extra set of clothing, in case one of us got dirty or wet. Jason would be good to have as well. With his size, I could probably hide enough just underneath his shirt. That is, after he had enough time to laugh at me. I guess no matter how much time passes, you never really stop missing your friends. Ah, I have an idea. Teresa shouts, breaking me out of my thoughts. She comes running over, wrapping me in a blanket. The village never saw a reason to send me male clothing, but this was an immensely popular style of dressing not too long ago. It was called a toga. She wraps the blanket tightly around me, then gives me a quick couple of tugs to make sure it was secure. It used to be worn by nobles and leaders where I once stayed. When I moved further north, I did not see it again, however. I also enjoyed them. I do not understand why they seem to have fallen out of favor. She steps back and admires her handiwork, as I feel just slightly less exposed. It's wonderful. Thank you, Teresa, for your quick thinking. I chuckle as I cautiously position myself to sit down. Teresa takes a seat next to me. So, back to business? What's the plan? I ask Teresa, and she looks struck completely off guard. Plan? How am I supposed to create a plan while I worry over you? She says with a mix of sarcasm and seriousness. Right, well, let's come up with one then. What do you think is our best option? Hmm... We will not be able to hide much longer. The Underdwellers will be expanding their scope and search more and more as we wait. It was a miracle they have not stumbled upon my home yet. So we have to launch our offense then. It should hopefully go a little bit longer now that you don't have to worry about me anymore, right? I will always continue to worry over you. Teresa grips my hand as she says this. I know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... I stutter. I have revived you from the brink of death twice, and the second time was a miracle that it was successful. There is nothing more that I could do to bring you back if you get harmed again. There are no more second chances. I have no further cures to stand off the Reaper. She tightens the grip on my hand. You must not be reckless with your life anymore. I have done all that I can. There is nothing more I can give. Her eyes stare intensely into mine as she makes her point. I take these words to heart. After a long silence, Teresa speaks up again. Our target before was the power plant. It is possible we still may be able to take it over. What we find there may lead us to our next point of interest. I think about this. It seems like the only way we might be able to get some direction. Otherwise... We might just simply be running into a random area with hopes of stumbling upon the Underdwellers. If we take too long, we will get worn out. We can't fight forever, so that is our plan. We will be heading out tomorrow. If I get back, I will tell you how it went. If we don't make it back, this should send in three days. Much like when I began this story, I really don't know where to begin. I'm just going to tell you things as they happened from when we left. I never thought it would end like this. Teresa and I put our armor on and equipped ourselves for our offensive. Teresa insisted that I keep the shield again, and I can't argue with her. So we ran, and for the first time I experienced the true speed that Teresa can sprint. It felt almost effortless. But in under five minutes, we had traveled halfway to the mountain from the power plant without being spotted. I couldn't believe it. 
I did not realize the extent that Teresa held herself back for me. I thought I was strong with her blood, but I did not have a fraction of the strength she truly possesses. It still makes me wonder if she isn't holding back from my inexperienced self. When we reached the power plant, there was guards posted at every entrance. This is as far as we could go without causing a ruckus. Teresa and I look over at each other, and she nods in agreement. Together we strike the two underdwellers before they could react. Their heads fall to the floor as their bodies slump over. How were we able to do that? What about their shield? Their force field? I whisper over to Teresa. Their portable technology is recent, or at least recent to my knowledge. It takes time before they can mass produce their latest inventions. Grunts like these are not worth the resources in Underdweller eyes. Now come, there's little doubt a patrol will round by here soon. We must make use of the time before we are discovered. She opens the door for me and we slip quietly inside. Arrows point towards the different places within the building. I guess they don't want their workers getting lost. We travel down towards the boiler first. Along the way, it is eerily quiet. No underdwellers within the building, performing maintenance or oversight of any kind. As we enter the boiler, it is empty. The only thing of note is the odd rewiring they had performed. Pieces of their technology are graded within ours, and a stone sits as the only fuel source. It radiates the same sickly purple glow that seems to follow wherever the underdwellers touch. We back out and head towards the generator. There we see a group of six underdwellers setting up circuitry, seemingly trying to create a direct line between their underground base as a power plant. The only reason I could think of them doing this is that they are planning to take over and occupy the remains of my town, create their own foothold on the surface world. Hell if I'm going to let that happen. I look over to Teresa and she gives me a nod again. Together, we were able to kill two of the Underdwellers without resistance, but the other four are able and ready their weapons. They are wearing armor covered in thorns that glow the same shade as the knife that knocked Teresa out. They hiss and screech at us, spitting curses in their gravely language. At least I assume they are curses. I don't understand a thing. These underdwellers are more prepared than any of the others. Pistons attached to their arms and legs making them much faster and stronger than I have previously fought. Here I was, thinking my newfound power was going to make this easy. But these bastards are always one step ahead. Teresa makes the first move, lunging at the Underdweller to the left. Her blade nicks the skin of it before the creature deflects the blade with force that knocks Teresa briefly out of stance. Another Underdweller attempts to stab her while she is off her footing, but I rush in to parry it in time. As to my encounter, his legs filing him backwards leaving dust in the place where sturdy concrete once stood, Teresa and I take a step back as well. We are not able to defeat them in head-on combat. Their machines are too swift. Teresa whispers. How are they reacting to us in time, though? When I first saw you fight, you were nothing but a blur. I don't know. However, it is no matter. We must fight as one. They can react to one of our attacks, yet are unable to react to both at once. If they could, they could not need to have their ally counterattack for them. The Underdwellers eyed us, waiting for us to make the next move. I take focus on their eyes and see the purple glowing from the previously milky white orbs. They have augments in their eyes as well. I think that's what is letting them react to us. It's also why they aren't attacking us right now. They need us to attack so they could react. Keen eye, Toby. We may be able to use that if we find a way how to disable them. Let us label them by weapon, sword, wielder, pike, spear, mace, understood? What is the difference between a spear and a pike? I asked sheepishly. Teresa signs. Spears are shorter and usually one-handed. Pikes are longer and usually two-handed. Ready? Got it. Ready. Pike! 
Teresa shouts as she lunges again, striking hard against the pike. The Underdweller manages to block, but Teresa's attack knocks the pike wielder out of position. I ran behind it, and just as Teresa said, it was unable to react in time. My blade struck through the Underdweller's body, erupting from its chest. Spear! This time, I take initiative, throwing the body of pike and sword to misdirect before taking a stab at Spear. The impact of his parry nearly sends my sword flying from my hand, but Teresa is there in under a second. Her sword runs through the spear wielder's skull, and he flops over dead. Sword and mace are huddled next to each other. Sword! Teresa takes the lead again, clashing against the sword of the Underdweller. As I rush in to take my swing, I see a mace fast approaching my face. I barely duck out of the way, and I am forced to step back again. Sword regains his composure as well, taking a swipe at Teresa that forces her to fall off as well. Again, you strike first this time. Teresa commands me. Mace! I take my attack, and Mace meets me with equal might. I hear a clang shortly, and I know to pull back before Mace decides to take a swing at me. Teresa and I meet him. They have adapted our strategy. We will not be able to strike them down so long as they remain on each other's shield. Teresa analyzes them, looking for her next opening. Hey, do you remember Plan B? I nudge Teresa. I nudge Teresa as I glance at the concrete dust at our feet. Her eyes followed mine, and I see a faint smile form. I scoop up the dust with my boot, and I fling it in the eyes of the Underdwellers. They shriek and swing wildly at the air as Teresa and I both rush to their sides and slash our preferred targets. Mace and Sword both fall, and quiet fills the air once more. We take a closer look at what the Underdwellers were working on. The wires and gadgets make little sense to me, but I noticed one thing that gave me pause a display that seemed to be changing every second, written in their unreadable language. I knew better than to think this was some simple clock. I grabbed Teresa's hand and dragged her out of the building as fast as I could run, the sound of high-pitched whistles chasing us on our way out. We reached the door before everything was set off. The ground shook beneath our feet, something even more fierce than a behemoth's tremors. From below, pillars erupt, and slowly the ground started to sink inside. Whatever they were doing here, we were too late. Before my eyes, I watch as even the dead and desolate remains of my former life are swallowed by an oversized drill. Once the drill finishes, it flips upside down and a city is revealed. A dark city made of the blackest stone, windowless, artless, built strictly for the purpose to serve. The only light that emerges from it is the disgusting purple glow, running through the tubes all along the city. The whole place is brimming with creatures that come flooding out, including five behemoths that get to work flattening the ground area for expansion. Atop what appears to be a dark temple stands that underdweller, the first one we came into contact with. He stands mighty above his city, standing as if prepared to give a declaration. Little did I know that is exactly what was going on. From an unknown source, the Underdweller's voice could be heard all around. At first, the speech played in their own language, but something was translating it to us. My fellow Monumentals, today marks a tremendous occasion, the beginning of the colonization of the surface world. Long have we feared the human race, but here I have displayed that humans can be defeated. With patience, we will claim this world. Let this be known as the beginning of an end for humanity. A thunderous applause of screeches erupted from the city below, and the head underdweller takes the moment to soak it all in. Once the crowd settles down, he speaks again. I hope you enjoyed my speech, dear lizard lurking these streets. Worry not, soon you will be reunited with the rest of your kin in whatever afterlife you believe in, I'm sure. If you want to make it even sooner, come out of hiding and end this fast. 
Snickering can be heard from the city below. Seeing the Underdwellers replacing my home with their own, threatening to take over the entire Earth, and taunting carelessly as they do it, it all unleashes something I didn't realize was still lurking within me. My head runs wild. The bastards. They trample over my home, my friends' homes. Every time I think there is nothing more that they could take from these old wounds, they still find a way to tear them back open. I could feel the scales sprouting from my fingers. I grow sick of being forced to tolerate the existence of these roaches. But they just made their biggest mistake. I could feel the bone protruding from my back, trying to break free from the pressure inside my armor. They just opened up their entire civilization to my wrath. I could kill them all. I will kill them all. I will make them feel every speck of pain they have inflicted upon me. I will. I feel my helmet fly off my head. I spin to face my assailant, and it's Teresa. Teresa kisses me, and I feel my entire being relax. I will take your burden. You do not listen well to my warnings, do you? It is no matter. Allow me to take your sorrow, your rage. For I know that my love for you is far greater than the suffering you have faced. My love will guide my will. Teresa removes her armor. I see the scales appear on her as I feel my own recede. Wings erupt from her back as mine retreat back within me. All my pain has been replaced with eternal peace. As Teresa's eyes glow red. She's not just empathetic. She is an emotional conduit. Teresa glows and towers over the behemoths. Her scales are a brilliant white that reflect absolute purity, and her eyes transition back from blood red to her sparkling emerald green. With a roar, she announces to our foes, they now face the true power of the Trevenir. Effortlessly, Teresa flies in a circle, cutting through each behemoth before she lands and prepares for the assault that will soon take place against her. Roars fill the air as swarms of wreck and Wolfnir pour from the city into her direction. She spews fire and her radiant white flames incarnate the wreck as they try to fly towards her. With a stomp of her foot, countless Wolfnir are reduced to paste. Despite her overwhelming strength, the floods keep coming. Wolfnir began to jump and climb on her as the rack poke and prod her. This isn't good. She can't fend them off forever. There's so many, it seems endless. I rush the face the only thing I could think to stop this. Seemingly unfazed, the head underdweller calmly walks back inside his temple. I catch up and confront the head underdweller as he enters the deeper reaches of his temple's chamber. With my head cleared of my indiscriminate rage, and against my better judgment, I feel obligated to try and negotiate a peaceful surrender. Plenty of bad people in charge do plenty of bad things, and the consequences usually fall on the ones who lay powerless beneath them. While I will do whatever it takes to end this, I'd sleep better at night without the guilt of countless lives on my chest. Your conquest ends here! You have one chance to surrender, and I swear that Teresa and I will spare any innocence in your city. That is the best I can offer you. The head underdweller turns to face me. What a surprise. Even with lizard blood in your veins, lizard scales on your body, I would never expect you to survive for so long. Tell me, does it mean that lizards do not eat their mates? I grit my teeth. Let's give reason one last chance. Do you not care for the innocence you lord over? Children? Family? Is there anyone you care about in that city beyond yourself? The head underdweller smirks. Children? You think we would expose our youth to this polluted cesspool? Unlike you, human, we value our future generations. The rest of these residents are simple fodder test subjects to see if your surface is even inhabitable. The only thing valuable in this civilization is I, Krasok, the Enlightened. The creature raises its arms as if its name was supposed to mean something to me. At this point, I could see there is no reasoning with him. I ready myself and rush at him. 
The moment I make impact, I am flung back away and go crashing into a wall. Ah, the Underdweller hisses gleefully. It is all making sense now. The unusual loss of soldiers and beasts. Your extended survival. It all stems from events unforeseeable. Krazog begins to crackle to himself as I stand myself up. You poor boy. You poor fool. I told you this would come. Krasok's laughter intensifies as he works himself up to the crescendo. The lizard had made you her slave at the cost of your own humanity. You are a traitor to your kind. The creature's tackles echo in the temple chamber. Quiet, damn you. I didn't choose this. You forced it. I won't be lectured about being a traitor by a tyrant. Tyrant. In my language, there is no such word. Taking power by force is simply the way of life. Do you see? This is what we do. We live to conquer. We live to make creatures of war. Those who can make the strongest weapons are rightfully rewarded. There is no innocence amongst my species in the moral eyes of yours. So you think you've earned your lofty title? Krazok the Enlightened? What a joke. What about making Wolfnir or Behemoths makes you enlightened? Making a child's toy like that? Nothing. I would be nothing if my greatest achievement was some mutt. If I must, allow me to show my credentials. His wrenched face twisted into a smile as he spoke. With the press of a button on his shoulder, the rumbling returned. I turned to Teresa to see the wolf near and Rack retreating away from her. She seems as confused as I am. The center of the city explodes, creating a deep chasm, and from the abyss rises the one thing that could have ever struck the icy chill of fear into our hearts after all Teresa and I have been through. Her face was a mix of pain, sorrow, fear, and disgust when she laid eyes upon the reanimated remains of her fellow Travnir. Although the Travnir had long died, the rotted remains were puppeted by machinery and malice. What may have remained in the mind of the fallen was long gone. It was now just a host to the machine brain piloting its defiled corpse. Teresa wailed in agony and I wept with her. My masterpiece. And thanks to you both, I could add two fresh additions to my growing collection. Krazog gazed at his handiwork and I used the distraction to try and end this fight. I lunged at him, but this time he pulled his weapon and deflected me. Of course, I should have known he would have an exoskeleton too. Unlike the others, he had no purple glow in his eye. Without warning, his weapon began to slash at me at a pace that I could hardly keep up with. His sword collided with my chest plate, and I could feel something shift. With his other arm, he punched my chest, knocking me down and crumbling the armor. My entire chest was now vulnerable. Krazok smirked, but did not delay. He leapt towards me and re-engaged in combat. Every piece of armor he was able to hit with his weapon grew weak and brittle. While he had not harmed me yet, I was getting more and more exposed. I did not realize he was toying with me. He tore off my armor bit by bit while he slashed away at me and I was helpless to defend myself. The other suits were clunky, nowhere near this refined. I finally had to take a risk. At this pace, he was going to kill me. I turned, sacrificing back half to my chest plate, and plunged my sword through myself. The blow was able to get past him and struck him shallowly in the gut. He recoiled looking at his wound, then to me, eyes now filled with rage. You're clever, I'll honor you with that. Enough playing, then. It's time for research. Where did I stab that girl? In a blink, he was in front of me again. I felt his knife dig into my side and all the energy drained from my body. I let go of the knife, leaving it inside me as I collapsed on my back. Let's see how much exposure it takes for the poison to properly kill from this specific wound site. You keep groaning in pain until you expire, understood? I want to witness the fruits of my labor. He steps over to look over the balcony. Teresa is still fighting off the defiled Travnir. Her fires do not phase it, and she is now blow to blow against it. 
I can see significant damage on the mechanical monster, but Teresa is also bleeding heavily. Even a decaying Travnir must still be strong enough to crack scales. There is no clear indication of who will give out first. I still need to end this. I need to save Teresa from that nightmare. I collect all my strength left within me to keep silent as I move the knife from my side. In agonizing pain, I manage to clench my teeth and keep quiet as I creep up behind Krasok. He mutters to himself, engrossed in the battle and his monstrosity performance. He hears the splash of my blood hitting the ground behind him, but it's too late. I fall upon him as he turns and plunge the dagger into his chest over and over. He throws me off of him, but the damage is done. I guess I'm still human after all. I gloat as I watch him gag and sputter. When he finally goes limp, I crawl my way over to his body. Looking up, the fight is going south. The damned cyborg is unaware of the damage it has taken, but Teresa is slowing down by her pain. I frantically try pressing everything on the collar, but nothing is happening. The undead monster manages to topple Teresa on her side, striking down hard on her as she is pinned. Thinking for a second, I grab the dead idiot's hand and I try using his own finger. I press multiple things until the defiled Travnir stops. Teresa wastes no moment in catching the thing's neck in her jaws and tearing its head off. She flattens the machinery underneath her claws, with a mighty roar that shakes the earth that announces her victory. She breathes her flames on the invading city, reducing the entire thing to smoldering rubble. I rush over to her as fast as I can in my weakened state, and upon seeing me, she walks over. With the great effort, she returns herself back to her human form before passing out. I catch her as she falls and wait for her to awake. Luckily, for the health of my heart, it doesn't take long for her before she opens her eyes again. Toby, why am I naked? She says gently with a sly grin on her face. Huh? I, um... I had nothing to do with this. I sputter out defensively as she giggles at me. I was so caught up in worry I hadn't even noticed. I only tease. My clothes do not grow with me, unfortunately. However, why are you naked? Oh, um, my tonga might have gotten cut by ribbons during my fight. I try to hide my embarrassment as I keep my gaze off of her. Is it over then? Are we safe? It is over. None of the Underdwellers remains. I assured her. Good. She breathes a sign of relief. Then I not need trouble with covering myself. Teresa pokes at my cheek, noticing I am still turned away from her. That is, unless my feelings are unrequited. She says in a sorrowful tone. No, that's wrong, Teresa. I love you too. I love you so much. You're the only thing that makes my world turn. The only thing I have left, but the only thing I need. I love you, and I respect you. And I just don't want to stare or be awkward because... Teresa grabs the top of my head and turns my head back towards her. If you wish not be awkward, then look at me, you fool. Do not think I hold the same revelations. I will stare at you as long as I please. And I invite you to do the same. But currently, I would like to stare into your eyes. She smiles that smile that makes my heart flutter with joy, the one that is both teasing and sincere. She puts her hand on my cheek as we kiss. I would like to thank all of you who had followed me along this journey, a journey I thought I would never actually survive. Although there are a few too many times I very nearly didn't. Your support has kept me sane and kept me going when things were looking bleakest. Teresa and I plan on staying here for a while. We don't know if the Underdwellers are fully gone yet. More may remain beneath our feet. And if that is the case, we will be ready. One day, we may reunite with civilization. If only for a brief moment. For now. All I want is to embrace the peace we have won. This small victory before the looming war. Teresa deserves this moment to live happily. 
That being said, we know this isn't the only location the Underdwellers exist. If your town is under attack, reach out to us. We will come running. If you hear howling from the woods, do not fight it alone. I swear to protect my kind, humankind, and Teresa has always been protecting us. Wherever, whenever we are called, we will join the fight once more. Until the howling in the woods has forever gone silent. <laughs>